also some thank yous. Start with the obvious. Here we are at the beautiful campus of CMU. S very, very appreciative uh, to David Buttergreen and others for arranging for this. Very tough time with a lot of students uh, all needing facilities and, and uh, we're, we're grateful to have the, the, this, the environment we're in. It's fantastic. Also, the sponsors for uh, this workshop, uh, Lockheed, uh, the SETI Institute, and um, Honeybee Robotics have all made uh, big contributions to make this, this possible, which is, uh, again, gratefully uh, received. Um, also, just in terms of receptions and giving us an opportunity to, to network, last night we had the uh, Astrobotics reception, which was fantastic. What a wonderful uh, location they have. The, 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 uh, the lab is fantastic for those of you who got to see it. And on Friday, though, there'll be details um, uh, pending. You should have received an invitation already uh, to Bossa Nova. Um, let us know if you did not receive that invitation for the Friday uh, reception. Um, so those are, um, uh, you know, uh, thank yous for, but there's also those that have contributed to just organizing this. And of course, there's um, people involved in, at NASA. Um, uh, so Mike Seabloom and others, uh, Carnegie Mellon, of course, again. And uh, at the SETI Institute, we had plenty of folks um, involved in getting this done. These, that's thank you at an institutional level. I'm going to just drop down to the individual uh, for one second and, uh, and thank Florence. Now, I added this slide <coughs> after she reviewed the deck because I knew she'd be super mad at me for putting it in. Uh, <laughs> And, but it's interesting, the reason why she doesn't want this slide, I know she'd make me take it out, it actually comes back to you. And you, you probably picked up on what she said. It's because she doesn't think of herself as the star of the show here. You are. Or more particularly, your ideas are. What uh, Florence's energy and kind of enthusiasm from day one in terms of getting this workshop to happen and, and the great work of the steering committee uh, as well around her. It's been to make sure that when you leave at the end of tomorrow, you go, well, that was time well spent, right? You're gonna have worked through ideas that stick, that don't just evaporate and, and get lost under your inbox when you get back to the office. They're so compelling that they're gonna stick and land somewhere. You're going to you know, work with your colleagues, develop papers, get funding, projects, pilots, flight testing, change missions. That's what this is about. So that's the star of the show. Um, that said, uh, none of us would be here without Florence's um, initiative. So your face is up there. <laughs> Okay, so um, brilliant. Let's, uh, with that tone then of let's make a difference, let's get to work. Um, you've got the agendas, but just to give you a sense of the overview, it's broken into two, two halves on the two days. Uh, today is really about networking and, and you know, just getting the mental gears spinning up with uh, some really great plenary presentations. Uh, there are panel discussions with interactive Q&A, there's posters, there's, and there's, no, you, there's no shortage of content. Our goal here is that tonight you're going to head back with your brains just buzzing and all that pent-up energy in your <laughs> mental energy is going to focus on day two where we roll up our sleeves and, and get to work and, and start to work through these uh, DRM uh, working groups and uh, get some output that, that matters. So uh, that's how we're gonna structure things. And uh, so I'd like to um, uh, kick things off um, uh, right away with a, a presentation by uh, David as a, a welcome to CMU. And uh, so um, over to you, David. I'll give you this mic, Thank you. and I'll launch your presentation and you can just click through it. All right, so welcome, uh, welcome to Carnegie Mellon. And you can use the space bar or click on the mouse, whichever you prefer. Oh, okay. So, uh, so this is the second uh, autonomy workshop. There was the one at SETI Institute last year. And I was going to start by telling you the story about uh, how it got to be here in Pittsburgh. Um, 
but I decided not to because of a conversation last night at uh, Astrobotic when uh, John Thornton spoke up and said, it's so great to have NASA come to Pittsburgh to talk about uh, space and autonomy. Um, and Rob said, well, why not Pittsburgh? You can do that work anywhere now, right? You don't have to be at a NASA center as technology development is going on all over the place. So thank you for coming to Pittsburgh if you haven't been here before or if you have been here. Um, I'm going to spend a few minutes of this introduction. They gave me 15 minutes. I've got to tell you about something. I'm going to tell you about Carnegie Mellon. Uh, i tell you about the, the research that we've done here. Um, and hopefully I've introduced a, a couple things that maybe be ideas that we talk about over the next couple of days. Uh, so at last, I, I, I do want to uh, repeat, if there's anything that we can do to make this workshop more successful, um, if I can make the room cooler, I will. Uh, but if there's anything you need, let me know. Um, we can probably make things happen quickly. We made a new projector happen yesterday or last week. Uh, so we can, we can uh, do whatever we need to do to get a great productive workshop here. So uh, I should also welcome you to the Robotics Institute. Uh, we're in Newell Simon Hall. This is home to the Robotics Institute, the largest academic research uh, department in robotics in the world, also the oldest, founded in 1979 uh, as a department that would uh, study all the areas of robotics. Um, we started a PhD program uh, in, uh, 10 years later. So we started basically as a research institute and then began education. We now have 360 graduate students in robotics here in the, uh, in the department, uh, studying everything you could possibly imagine. Um, we take a very broad view of, of what's robotics. We have an undergraduate program, so education is a big part of what we do, but still the core is research and technology development. The history goes back a little farther than that uh, to 1955 when the School of Computer Science was founded. And I, I just put this in here because I thought it was so neat that, well, the guys that this building is named after, Herb Simon and Alan Newell, um, some of their first research here was on a thing called the logic theorist, which was a theorem prover. It was a scientific tool to try to automatically, autonomously prove theorems, look at data, discover patterns, um, they actually did some of the very first work in using search as a way of reasoning um, and came up with the idea of heuristics, where if we don't know exactly how to do so something, maybe we can use some heuristic rules. So they start, I don't, you can do the math, it was a long time ago when, let's say, autonomy for science really got started. So if you think we're just like, this is the workshop in which we're going to create autonomy for space, we're like 50 years too late. Okay. So um, as I said, I do want to tell you some things about uh, the Institute and the work that we've done here. Uh, and I, I, I guess the thing I would point out is that the research just with NASA working on space and autonomy for space goes back 30 years. So, um, so I've been at Carnegie Mellon a long time. I've been on the faculty since 2000, but I was an undergraduate here. And in 1989, I was working on a NASA funded project that I'll, I'll tell you about in a minute. So there's a long history of autonomy uh, for space. Um, it's not something that we're just starting to put together today. Um, the other thing I would say is that the kind of work that we do here at the Institute and the, the research that I do, we're trying to look 10 years out or more. So I'm not trying to necessarily develop technology for missions that are upcoming right now, but we're trying to do the things that we think will be needed a uh, long time in the future. So that's part of why I'm really excited about this workshop because you're going to figure out, you know, what's the mission in 10 years, 15 years, and 20 years, and then I'm going to know uh, what kinds of research we need to do. So I did want to give a little disclaimer here. The projects I'm going to tell you about, this is a very CMU-focused talk, right? We're here at Carnegie Mellon, but the same type of great work has been going on at MIT, Stanford, uh, JPL, uh, NASA centers as well. I'm not going to talk about that. Yeah, you can tell each other about that. I'm just going to tell you about Carnegie Mellon. I hope you don't mind. Um, so as I said, uh, the research goes back quite a ways. This, the video you see there is a robot called Terrigator. That's 1984. That's the first off-road autonomous vehicle that was built here at Carnegie Mellon. Very shortly afterwards, we started to build this vehicle called the, the Nav Lab. Um, that, uh, that was the first, I guess, on-road autonomous vehicle. Again, trying to create robots that could drive 
in, or operate in unstructured environments. I just I tacked on a little uh, note there. So ALVIN, which stands for Autonomous Land Vehicle in a Neural Network, 1989. So a learning system uh, using neural networks to guide uh, a robot. Um, again, not something that showed up with deep learning three years ago, but uh, it's been, we've been working on this for quite a long time. Okay, so the beginning of space robotics research um, at Carnegie Mellon. This is a, a robot called the Ambler. Uh, I know when the laughing starts, you will have gotten to the second line about uh, how we are trying to build a robot that could go a thousand kilometers on Mars, uh, climb over one meter obstacles, climb 30 degree slopes. I guess maybe today we'd say those are very ambitious goals. So, uh, you know, 20 odd years ago, 30, almost 30 years ago, um, it was pretty, pretty ambitious. But, you know, that uh, in the days before Sojourner, that seemed like what we had to do to explore Mars. It also seemed like building a robot that was 12 feet tall and weighed a ton was not an unreasonable thing to do, right? Uh, yeah, and hours we're building. The, the guy up in the upper right there it weighs just ounces. But, so uh, those, those big red boxes there, they're like four refrigerators, were packed full of computers. Uh, and that's what it took to actually coordinate all those motions. The thing, the box on the top there, that white thing, is the first LiDAR scanner. You know, those Veldines that everyone's got on their self-driving cars? So that's the first 3D laser scanner. Um, and we put it on the robot so that we could get a detailed model of the, the rocks in front of it and automatically select footfalls and make this thing walk. Now, um, didn't go to Mars. We'll never go to Mars. Uh, but it sort of started this, this, uh, this series of projects in which we are trying to envision what would be possible in the future for um, uh, robotic exploration. So uh, that was followed shortly by a robot um, sponsored by NASA um, through, um, uh, well, it was called TRIWIG, the Tele-Robotics Intercenter Working Group. A few people out there might remember that as, as a, a coordinated effort for robotics research um, at NASA, that um, we, we sort of realized, and we're going to talk about this this afternoon, robotics in the wild, that if, if we wanted to build these systems that worked and were reliable, we had to test them out in the world. We couldn't do everything in the laboratory. So this project uh, built some robots and put them in volcanoes, because that would be hard, and that would sort of push us uh, to create technology that really worked. Um, I got a few stats on there. The robot didn't actually travel that far, um, just 276 meters. But, you know, by, actually by planetary standards, that's not too bad. Um, this is way before Sojourner, so um, we were sort of in the ballpark. Uh, and it did it in a volcano, um, uh, collecting data um, uh, from the bottom, uh, measuring gases and concentrations to help determine whether the, the volcano was active or going dormant. This is Mount, uh, the video there, sorry, Mount Spur in Alaska. This is about five years after it had erupted. Um, little stat down there. So 15% of the, that 276 meters was autonomous. The robot choosing its steps, controlling its motions, um, and doing that automatically. But a big fraction was teleoperated. Um, yeah. Uh, I can tell you about it at the break, but the robot ultimately did run into trouble, but it ran into trouble when it was being teleoperated. It did great when it was autonomous. <laughs> yeah, some of you knew the story. It ended up on its head instead of its feet in the end. Um, so in uh, 97, uh, Red Whitaker uh, wanted, was looking for another ambitious project, um, and uh, it started to, uh, he's looking primarily at lunar rovers, um, and we wanted to create a system uh, working with NASA Ames using some of their uh, remote uh, uh, visualization and uh, remote uh, experience technology um, to see what it would be like to have a robot that could go pretty quickly and, and navigate around. So we built this robot called Nomad. It's actually in a museum in Chile now um, uh, and demonstrated 100 kilometers of traverse in Chile controlled from California and actually controlled from a few... Um, a few different uh, museums around the United States. Um, so, may, but maybe the most important thing about that was that there was an algorithm called Morphin that uh, allowed this thing to operate 
autonomously. And there's a guy named Mark Maimon, who's at JPL. And shortly after we finished with, with the, uh, the Desert Check project, um, he started to develop something called Gestalt, which is the autonomous navigation software that runs on spirit and opportunity and curiosity. So some of that early technology made its way eventually into some flight systems. There are a few other algorithms that we threw in there later on as well. So um, another piece of work, again, trying to create robots that can explore autonomously, can operate on their own. Um, this idea of coordinating um, the behavior of the robot with the available resources. So you're seeing here a solar-powered robot um, called Hyperion. The video is actually on Devon Island, which is well above the Arctic Circle. So the sun is never setting. It's going around and around on the horizon. Um, so the robot actually explores um, the way you operate a sailboat. You know, you, you go with the wind for a while, and then you tack away from the wind, and you go with the wind. Well, with this robot, you go with the sun for a while, and then you tack away, and you uh, maybe go to a science uh, target, or you go around some obstacle or shaded region, and then you go back and operate with the sun again. So we're able to show continuous exploration over 24-hour periods with this robot and this early idea of uh, sun synchronous exploration. I heard someone say something about lunar poles over here, which is something I'm particularly excited about. So this is actually recent work. This is just for, uh, a student graduate, one of my students graduated, got his PhD last semester, um, continuing on this work using uh, the most recent digital elevation models of the moon from uh, LOLA and, and LRO, building slope models, and then uh, uh, rendering a lighting map. So these aren't images of the moon. That's actually rendered 3D models and then looking for roots of continuous light. So a robot like Hyperion that I just showed you could continue to explore on the moon and do that uh, in a continuous way. This is actually uh, a crater near Malapert Peak. Um, and for six months or so, you can go around and around um, uh, continuously. This is uh, some work um, uh, from Nate Alton uh, that we did with uh, uh, NASA Ames. This is. Um, um, Hayworth uh, crater, so one of the areas of permanently shadowed regions, and the reference mission that was being looked at there for um, uh, uh, looking at these uh, PSRs was about a 10-day mission, um, you know, a lunar day. And what we were able to show was that by tracking uh, the position of the sun, modeling that, modeling the communications, we could actually extend that mission out to 70 days. Now, you see the robot kind of runs around a lot. Um, it's, it's doing that thing where it's, it's using its resources and it's tracking with the sun. This is Shackleton Crater, uh, a shorter uh, mission. You can actually go around Shackleton Crater the same thing way you can Malapert. Um, but uh, in this case, we had a particular set of science goals that the robot was trying to reach. And the scientists had sketched out a plan how they thought they could do it. First of all, we showed that it wasn't going to work. The robot was going to end up in the dark for too long. But second, we were able to solve this problem um, using this, these computer algorithms and find a route that actually visited all their science goals and did it in a way that was uh, always lit. So uh, here's a case where computers and these, um, these planning algorithms uh, could do something that would be very hard for a person to figure out on their own. All right. Um, the... Uh, I guess this is a countdown clock here. So I've just got another couple minutes. Um, another piece of work here. This is, this is actually a robot called um, Zoe. Uh, we'll see it tomorrow at the, at the demo, um, parked quietly in the corner because it's sort of old, 2003. Um, but uh, so an interesting thing to point out about this was at the same time that Spirit landed on Mars, this robot was in Chile uh, and demonstrated its first one kilometer single command cycle traverse. So it's navigating autonomously for uh, that whole kilometer um, uh, just from uh, the guidance of some waypoints that the scientists had selected. While it was doing that, it was operating instruments and sort of collecting data on the fly. Um, 
So navigating autonomously is a really important thing. It's going to be important for all the, the missions that we talk about. But it's not good enough just to go from place to place. You have to do useful things as you travel. Um, and some of those are not uh, predetermined. You have to be able to uh, measure the environment and then make decisions on the fly. What is useful data to collect? What is useful observations? Um, so here's an example of a system. This is from 2008 uh, that is automatically detecting features out in the world tracking them as it moves and collecting spectra uh, from the robot, sort of pointing and shooting as it rides along. Uh, some of that work evolved into a nice uh, little uh, component now on uh, a MER opportunity uh, that um, could detect uh, features and retarget the imaging and collect that data for the first downlink rather than waiting for a few command cycles. Got a thumbs up there from JPL, so I guess that's a good thing. All right, um, so last couple quick things. Um, current work uh, is looking at how do we have a scientist and a robot work together uh, and communicate in the language of a scientist. So rather than uh, telling the robot, go here, do this, go here, do that, go here, do this other thing, tell the robot, here's the, the problem we're studying, here's the hypotheses, Here's how you can use measurements to test these hypotheses and have the robot operate um, on its own for a period of time, making those decisions about what observations to make, and then updating the model or updating the belief state of those hypotheses so that it can measure whether it's making progress and decide whether it needs help. Um, so that's, that's kind of current research. I'm going to sort of leave it there with one last thing. As I said, we, um, we try to work 10 years in the future, so this is last year. This is a totally autonomous uh, vehicle. Um, it is traveling at speeds up to 25 miles an hour. Wouldn't that be exciting for a lunar rover? Um, it is doing obstacle avoidance with no prior model of the environment. Um, and this is the technology that's available that we're working on today and the kind of thing we hope to uh, um, get into, uh, into space in the future. I should Passing. stop there. OK, that's wonderful. David, thank you so much. That's fascinating. <laughs> There you go. And uh, very evident to all the kind of innovation that's going on in the Robotics Institute here. So very fitting that this is uh, where the workshop is, is taking place. Um, the uh, next speaker is Thomas Rubukin. So I think uh, you all know him well, I'm sure, uh, by reputation, if not personally. So um, we'll get Thomas to come up in, uh, um, in one second. We'll just get the uh, presentation rolling. And um, I'm going to uh, just get you a uh, timer so you can see where things are at. Um, okay, and uh, to step through it, just use the space bar. Very good. Well, I'm glad to be here today. Uh, first of all, I'm, uh, this year I'm uh, always telling the same story. So I'm going to tell you that too. Uh, today it's a story about 60 years of exploration. Uh, of course, uh, six years of exploration on which we're building. I think from looking back, we learn about the future. And we learn, for example, that the injecting technology into missions is not only something that would be nice to do, it's absolutely essential to do the kind of stuff that we want to do in the future. There's many missions that currently we cannot uh, think about uh, other than in some kind of artistic view. And I'm going to show you two or three that I think are absolutely worth doing uh, for that. This is uh, a graphic uh, there uh, of, uh, uh, that's of missions. And in the center of that mission, of course, is Explorer 1. Explorer 1, I remember, of course, is uh, the response of the United States to, uh, to that beeping thing uh, that flew over our heads uh, first, uh, being beat uh, by our uh, adversaries. Uh, um, you know, uh, the, the Soviets at that point. Uh, and so basically our response was the first science experiment. A science experiment that was, uh, of course, led by Van Allen and then uh, JPL by Pickering and uh, Von Braun coming together from the systems perspective, the instruments perspective, and propulsion. The technologies, all of these technologies, in many ways the instrument was the simplest. It's a simple counter. You know, uh, the hard part, though, was get the electron getting the electronics done. And, and, you know, I don't know what you do but for, for fun, but what I try to do for fun is sit down with people who did it 
and actually learn uh, how they did it. And, and so in this case, some of these stories are just amazing. Grad students uh, really making these boards by hand and, you know, like hacking them until the very day of the flight, uh, putting them on. That's that kind of exploration spirit that, of course, leads to that image, uh, a success uh, on which we're building uh, even today. So fast forward and basically ask kind of in uh, 1987, what are the missions that we did? So kind of just, uh, uh, you know, 30 years or so uh, later after 1958, January 31st, which is where that picture was from. And you basically realize that, yeah, quite a number of uh, activities already occurred. Some of our players uh, that, that we uh, cherish, like the Hubble, is already kind of in the development picture. Boldface, by the way, means that they're under development. Uh, the regular fund means that the missions are in flight. And you see basically that, that there's a heck of a lot under development. There's only very few things that were in flight. And so kind of that, if you want that curve, that innovation curve starts going up uh, with missions such as uh, the pioneers, of course, that were, that were uh, you know, really pathfinders in many ways of the, uh, towards the outer uh, solar system and then the Voyagers uh, right behind them. Uh, basically the first uh, real Mars uh, uh, missions, that the missions that were already completed are not on there. So some of these uh, Vikings and so forth are not. But the, you, you get my point that, for example, at Earth Science, uh, really exciting uh, missions uh, started to come together. And the shuttle uh, was a platform for a lot of the work, uh, that a lot of the analysis uh, that was there. Uh, Go uh, fast forward to where we are right now, and uh, that's, that's where we are. The good news is um, we have many eyes looking at, at the Earth in many different colors, many different uh, ways, and, and we have the space station as one of the platforms uh, to do work. Uh, some of these things are enabled by autonomy. Many of them are enabled by sensors and some pretty standard platforms that we started to use and scale on, uh, especially at Earth, uh, but also uh, uh, looking at uh, observations in astrophysics where, where basically in many of the analysis bigger is better. And the simple reason for that is that the questions that we're after uh, are questions where, as they say, every photon is sacred, right? Because, because basically, because it's, 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 it basically what happens is that, that the objects of interest are very, very, very faint and they hang out next to very, very, very bright things. And so, so, basically, so basically doing it the right way basically requires that we come up with architectures with, with ways of, of uh, doing that that frankly we don't know yet uh, how. Uh, you look at Webb, who's up there, and I, I can tell you I'm spending a lot of time on Webb, whether I like it or not. <laughs> you know? and, so, and the reason for that is it's right at the edge of technology. You know, it's kind of, I think what we're learning from Webb, and those of you who are uh, in the technology space are learning from web that the way you develop technologies is the right way. It's kind of sometimes no new technology is not a good thing because we become irrelevant. Doing it all at once is probably also not a good thing, you know, because basically what happens if you do it all at once is uh, the technologies uh, in systems start interacting with each other, new technologies. So you have n, n new technologies. The risk is that you have n squared interfaces that start driving you in a way that actually a TRL scale is not very good at measuring. Because frankly what happens is that new technology and that new technology intersect in a way that the system, it drives the system in a totally new, dif in a different way. By the way, that's also what's happening with some of these technologies that are currently uh, being developed in a self-driving type of environment. You know, environmental constraints, new sensors are doing just the same thing. It's a really complicated problem. I see that in space as well, uh, as we see uh, many, of the other, uh, many of the other platforms. So that's where we are right now. So one of the things I, I wanted to really do coming uh, to NASA, and uh, believe it or not, by the way, this clock is not running, so you want me to talk forever. So, so why, don't you, why don't you give me a five minute uh, warning? All right, so basically what I... <laughs> I can stop in the middle of the sentence. So anyway, so... So one of the things that uh, I wanted to uh, do uh, coming to NASA two years ago is to really make sure that uh, we recognize that innovation is absolutely essential. So in other words, uh, even though uh, innovation in many ways relates to some risk, and I just talked about web, 
Uh, the reason I did that is not to say that we shouldn't do web, it's that we should do innovation the right way and that we should learn from every experience. And it's okay to overshoot a little bit sometimes. It's also, what's also uh, okay is to undershoot a little bit sometimes, but we need to correct both. And so basically what, what's really uh, critical is that we looked at kind of some domains in which we want to uh, make uh, headway. You saw, for example, that the first initiative that uh, we put together is kind of a small satellite initiative. And the simple reason for that is because of the fact that we think that there's a lot of uh, technologies out there that allow us to do science on platforms that are a lot cheaper and a lot more agile than the platforms that uh, we're using generally. And so, so we did that. And, and kind of for me, the goal is actually not that we suck everything into NASA. The goal is that we're creating an ecosystem uh, with commercial players, with academic players, and, and uh, with NASA in a way that basically enables these, brings us, uh, uh, enables uh, two things. First of all, to do some of the measurements cheaper and, and also to do some measurements that otherwise we could not do at all. Constellations of small spacecraft, for example, are way too expensive in the current paradigm. So we need to develop them bottoms up, if you want, kind of in a disruptive sense. That's what uh, small satellites are about. Uh, intelligent systems and high level autonomy is another one. And then I could give you like two, three visions of how I uh, think about this. But you see, there's others new sensors, high end computing. We're spending a lot of time. Uh, right now in parallel in another activity looking at data. Uh, just like, I mean, uh, my personal feeling is, and I, I'm sh sure many of you share that, is that, that it's a shame that uh, if, if we have all these amazing data and we're not really exploring them because of the fact that human speed is too slow to actually go find uh, the exciting science that's there. And computers, of course, can do that for you if you know how to interact with that. That's, of course, domains that are being developed right now, computational domains, new ways of learning, deep learning, new ways of uh, analysis that are being developed now. Many of our students know that. My kid, who did his internship in a data company this summer, is better at this than I was educated in my PhD in astrophysics, right? And so in the late 90s. And so for me, uh, really uh, taking advantage of that. But autonomy uh, is one of those key domains. So the reason we're meeting here is because of a, a strategic interest. So it's not because we want to check a box. It's because we're really trying to learn what we should be doing. Uh, we always talk about what science is about, this discovering the secrets of the universe, uh, searching for life elsewhere is one of those uh, topics, and then, of course, protecting and improving life on Earth. I could talk about this forever, but what I wanted to do is just give you three visions and ask our artists to give you visions. The goal is not to believe what's there, but the goal is to kind of think about the underlying science that it's, that it's enabling. Imagine we're landing on Europa. Imagine we sat down on Enceladus, and we have underwater robots that are analyzing organic residuals or perhaps even, God knows, biological samples. We don't know. At that interface, we don't that actually understand a lot. But we need to go there to do that. This is way too far away from the Earth to do anything kind of with a joystick, right? It's kind of, it has to be autonomous. It has to be, in many ways, uh, enabled by the very technologies that are that are here. So how do we get from where we are today, there? That's the first image I wanted to talk to you about. Second one is this one. I believe that one of the uh, real paradigm shifting ways of using autonomy is actually in conjunction with human explorers. I believe that uh, both robots that are there, uh, robots that are flying if there's an atmosphere, and uh, robots that are driving, are actually enabler, enablers for reconnaissance. So it kind of the science is not that you walk down the street and figure out that there's a cliff. You already have that. Uh, you have already that image from remote sensing data. But you look around the corner. You look uh, in the, down where in, in into areas where you cannot access uh, uh, the, the, the region. You look at that with uh, robots that remain to be discovered. And frankly, I don't want the guy in the middle to control those by really moving the head the right way by prioritizing, by doing that, the uh, robots should support the mission that this uh, human and uh, her expedition have uh, at this moment in time. So, so basically, for me, that uh, is uh, the second image that I wanted to uh, draw out. 
Uh, the third MHS1, uh, I think that I'm, I'm really excited about because I think we're at the cusp of it. We talked about small satellites. It's only one dimension of innovation that is there. The other one is responsive and interconnected networks. I think it would be absolutely uh, cool if satellites told each other what to look at. Uh, if satellites actually, as they overfly in a low Earth orbit, uh, tell, uh, basically give the relevant information to the other, perhaps bigger assets that need to collect more photons so the interesting things are collected, as opposed to drowning an avalanche of data. I would like that data on my phone in a timely fashion, looking around the corner again, not because I have a robot flying ahead of me, but because over, overhead uh, are assets that provide value to me on a regular, uh, on a regu uh, on a regular uh, uh, cadence. And uh, who cares about me? Uh, create value for the people in Florida right now. Create value for, uh, for uh, everybody who is, uh, has, is of course, uh, uh, not only uh, influenced by uh, people itself, but I, by the environment. To me, that uh, kind of constellation of novel, connected, interconnected, and smart overhead systems, I think is something that's in reach, but we're not there yet. So for me, that is also a dimension of autonomy that we should aspire to. So those are so three. You saw each one of them uh, in a domain of science. You could drive your own. Uh, you could draw your own images, but I would argue that you should. So what's really important is to draw a future and then pull it back into the presence. That's what technology is, is really about. And that is uh, really what we would like you to do, which is to explore with us, kind of open up. Uh, the vast majority of things that remain to be discovered the vast majority of things in which we want to use space are not discovered yet at this moment in time. We have not figured out how to use. So do not think in any way, just because we've been thinking about it for decades, we're at the end of it. Uh, we would like, of course, to build on top of what we've done so far. And uh, it's your aspirational goals and your imagination that will drive how far. Thanks. You know, I think it's worth um, just noting the, the, the artwork is inspirational, but it's the, the thing that's interesting is when you think about the maturity that's clearly underway with AI, and that's the vector that I come into this from. But now the requirements, as we start to explore actively where light speed latency is relevant, Mars, Enceladus, Europa, and so on. Um, and I thought it was really interesting, the artwork that you, and the way you depicted um, the Martian scene where it's not an either-or thing. It's not manned or robotic. It's, it's a partnership because boots on the ground is incredibly expensive. So you better optimize every second of that with, with autonomous capabilities that maximizes the value of the astronaut. So I think that's uh, very inspirational. Thank you for, for the presentation. Yeah. Um, okay, so we are going to move uh, next up to, to Mike uh, Seabloom. And... As he comes up, I'm just going to make a note of something that Florence pointed out to me. I'm not sure this is a great metaphor or image, but these two have a lot of energy they brought into uh, this workshop, but they're um, very fittingly also uh, hurricanes. So uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if you're happy about that image or not. So let's think of the positive energy uh, of that metaphor and not the destructive one. Over to you. Uh, let me, I'll, as, as you start into it, I'll, I'll get your timer ready. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you can All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was, uh, it was interesting. There was a Hurricane Florence and a Hurricane Michael in the, in the same year. Um, and, and they're both making landfall, unfortunately. Um, anyway, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming, uh, for taking time out of your busy schedules. Uh, this is important. Uh, an important workshop for us. Um, we've identified uh, that the capabilities of autonomous systems, or robotics, and artificial intelligence are accelerating rapidly. I mean, you could make this statement probably 10 or 20 years ago, it would still be true. Uh, what we're seeing now is the proliferation of a number of commercial products. Um, so it's, I think, in our best interest to uh, from a programmatic uh, view to look back and make sure we're making the correct investments um, for our future missions. Um, what we really need to understand is what are the capabilities today, what is state of the art, 
Um, how might these capabilities evolve over a short period of time? For us at NASA, planning the missions requires a decade or more. So what is state-of-the-art today is uh, certainly useful information, but we also need to understand uh, where the technology might be um, in, the, in the decades to come so that we can plan accordingly. And that's difficult to do. That kind of technology forecasting is not easy to do. Um, how can SMD leverage these capabilities to craft bolder missions that are achievable in terms of cost and risk? Um, how can we use these technologies to, um, to, to make missions that will, will improve the science? That's really the, uh, the bottom line. Um, autonomy, artificial intelligence, these are not areas where NASA necessarily is uh, uh, blazing the trail. Um, industry is doing a lot of that. So we have to figure out ways to partner with industry um, and to leverage uh, the capabilities uh, to maximize the benefits. And then finally, um, most importantly, what new investments do we need to be making? How do we craft our programs accordingly uh, to take advantage of, of what the landscape looks like today? So this workshop is, is designed to bring together uh, three groups of people. Uh, the scientists who are, are crafting the missions uh, of the future, our program executives who are providing the funding to invest in the technology, and our industry partners that are, uh, are leading the way at the moment in this particular area. Um, I'd like to just call out the people of our, our program committee who helped make this possible. Uh, Lena Bratz is here from uh, Booz Allen. Where are you, Lena? Um, she's probably outside. Um, Bill Diamond, of course, from the SETI Institute. Uh, who provided the sponsorship for the workshop. Uh, Marge Cole uh, from Earth Science. Uh, Tom Schwick from JPL, who's uh, important for a lot of the robotic missions in planetary science. Graham McIntosh, who you all met. Um, Mike Little, our, uh, the head of our Advanced Information Systems Technology Program, the only uh, information systems uh, program we have uh, in Earth Science. Um, for technology. Uh, Terry Fong, uh, a big help uh, in identifying the industry partners uh, who are here today. Terry is our capability lead at uh, NASA for autonomy um, and has been a big part of these workshops. Lisa Callahan, our uh, uh, point of contact from the uh, Office of Chief Technologist. Uh, David Wettergreen, who uh, just gave a talk. Uh, here at Carnegie, and David, we appreciate all your help. And of course, Florence, who uh, made all this happen. Uh, we'll miss all the weekly telecons and the, <laughs> and the emails and everything, but <laughs> thank you very much, Florence. And I'd also like to thank the, uh, uh, the DRM leads and the two panel leads. Terry will be leading one of the panels. And Jen Gestetic is here, uh, who's going to help us identify how we can partner with, uh, how NASA can better partner uh, with industry. Um, so we've got the key people here. Um, I'm happy that uh, Carolyn Mercer is here from Planetary Science. We have a new Planetary Science Technology Office, thanks to Carolyn's uh, hard work. Um, and that'll be uh, a critical. I think Planetary is, is a tall pole in, in a lot of these efforts. So, um, so thank you. and. Um, uh, the outcomes that we're looking at um, for the panels and the DRM teams, please take a lot of notes. The goal here is to put together a series of white papers that would uh, be suitable for a proceedings document that we'll probably put together after the holidays. But uh, the notes are important uh, before we, we lose track of, of the discussions that we've had. Um, we would like the, uh, for the design reference mission team leads to come to either NASA headquarters uh, next year or to visit the assessment groups and just kind of report out what was discussed and what the findings were. Um, and we're also planning to uh, hold a session at the uh, American Geophysical uh, Union meeting in San Francisco. Um, this will be for the uh, heliophysics, earth science, and planetary science, and maybe for AIAA 
uh, we'll reserve a session for the in-space assembly. Um, so those are the uh, anticipated outcomes from the meeting. Um, if there are any questions, I'll entertain them now. Otherwise, thank you very much for, for attending. Wonderful. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, everyone, if you could take your seats, we're going to start right now. Okay, folks, take your seats and we'll uh, get started. Thank you, everyone. I think that photo is going to look fantastic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, they're good kind of back on schedule uh, it, it, the rest of the day runs as planned except of course we bought an hour in the afternoon when Rob was meant to present and that's the silver lining in this is I think I know from experience uh, everyone appreciates good networking time and I will acknowledge some of those afternoon lightning talks man there was there's some great content in there and it wouldn't do them justice to do it in one minute so we'll kind of stretch things a little and uh, more Q&A, I think um, that's how we'll roll with it. So uh, that's the agenda change, and uh, over to you, Rob, and uh, looking forward to seeing what you have to say. Of course, yeah, here, Florence. Uh. So um, sorry, I couldn't, I tried to catch uh, one of the students who was coming here who hadn't been um, assigned a DRM. I got Eugene Fang, that's an another student from Joel Johnson's group. Uh, is that, were you assigned a DRM? Uh, yes, I was assigned. It's, it's got a zipper. But twice, there's a note taking. Uh, right, so could you please take notes from uh, the talks? Thank you. Okay. This is just a bit of a Perfect. housekeeping. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Th you know, uh, this, is, uh, this is a great privilege. I feel like I, 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 I had to admit when I left JPL to come here that I was coming for a boondoggle. Um, I've always wanted to see, see, come to CMU. I love this topic. And of course, I am not qualified to do this topic. I, I, I don't really do anything at JPL anymore. I'm chief engineer. Uh, so, uh, but I have been involved in this story, and I l I'm a storyteller at heart because I got to JPL and I hung out with these storytellers. In fact, my very first, the first engineer I ever met, it turns out, uh, was an undergraduate at Caltech, was a freshly retired JPLer by the name of Bill Pickering, uh, who, was, who was the guy holding up the rocket at the beginning. Uh, had I known who he was, I'd have been terrified to talk to him. But he was really sweet, and he introduced me to the world of electrical engineering and computer science, which I studied, so it was, uh, that's my background. Um, so like every, like every other good engineer, you give, give up on the stuff you're supposed to be good at and go into something else like parachutes and rover wheels that break. <laughs> so I've had a great time. I've had a wonderful time. I've been a great, a great time at JPL. Um, I, I, I've had the, uh, the career that I really wanted, that I, that I prescribed for myself when I was 12 years old, at least retroactively. Uh, uh, but it's been fun. So, okay, uh, okay, so because I'm an engineer, I'm going to talk philosophy. Uh, this is what we do. Um, I think about this. I, I really I do think. So, I, so I, I'm a big fan of Daniel Dennett, uh, who, who inspired me. Oh, how did I do that? Oh, I mean, oh, well, does it back up? It does. Look at that. So, uh, so uh, he wrote a book years ago called The Mind's Eye. Um, I, I was getting into computer science and, and uh, autonomous systems back, back in the 80s and then in the 90s. And he, so he wrote these wonderful books. And, I, and I've been following his, his writing over the years. One of them was a book called uh, 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 
the intentional stance, which is actually written a long time ago, but he's been up updated a couple, couple times, uh, uh, as, re as recently as night, the late 90s. <laughs> I'm so old, I am. So, uh, but it's cool. This is still valid today. So he, he defined um, uh, what he called uh, stances, a physical, which is basically abstraction layers for, for systems that we build. Um, uh, when, in, in level one, he called it, uh, was we're in a future state of a system that you build, or, or whatever it is, you've, is, or any complex system, whether it's biological, robotic, whatever it is, is based on the knowledge uh, where you can predict, we as observers can predict what's going to happen based on its physical constitution. You know, and that's simple, simple, something simple as a bimetallic strip that bends back and forth. Certainly, if, you've got, if you know the physics, uh, you can easily predict the amount that the thing moves, moves back and forth. Um, but we wouldn't give any sense, sort of sense of design in that thing. It's just a piece, it's just something it does. It's just a part of the physics. Um, uh, and because uh, and, I'm going to talk more about uh, kind of the, the, the old stuff we used to build, um, where we actually d d rely a lot on the <laughs> physical stance for, proper, for the emergent properties of complex systems. Oh, uh, oh good. Actually, you know, it's, it's actually not ticking. Oh, well, it's okay. Is it, should I hit the button again and hit restart? I'm already at 54 minutes. Oh, oh I just, just added an hour to it. What the heck? Okay, uh, so the next one was the design stances where engineers actually try to uh, integrate all these properties in complicated ways uh, where the future straight is predicted based on the knowledge of the intended person of the designer. So, 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 um, you can read the spec, and you, see, you read what the designer create, put something into it, uh, put put complexity into it, and actually, int and in the intent of what it was supposed to do was in the mind's eye of the designer, and and so <clears throat> this is really where we've been for for many for many decades, um, and then what's interesting is he defined uh, this is a more interesting one, um, uh, uh, where intentional stance, where and somehow the the uh, and. Uh, Gary, you mentioned the, uh, agency, where you in, in, in imbibe a, 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 or imbue, I should say, the, the, uh, the, the sense of objective intent into the thing you're building. And that's, of course, biology does that. Um, but now we're trying to do that. We're trying to give it a sense of intent. So the entity itself has an, have its, its own intentionality. And what's more, it might even have it's an understanding or a model of the intent of other agents that are, might be outside around it, um, including us. That means when the robot looks at you, it's thinking, wondering what you're thinking about, which is kind of cool. Um, we haven't got there yet, but we are trying to get toward of insisting some sense of intentionality of the system. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what does that mean uh, practically for us and what the kinds of things we're doing and it's a really based on a, a, the pre my main pro uh, premise or proposition here is that so much about uh, b being able to, to build upon capability is by instantiating comp um, better models of, of the system, its environment, inside the system itself. Uh, for example, you will never find a model of a bimetallic strip inside a bimetallic strip, right? Yeah, it just, it just does it, right? Um, it's an emergent property of physics. Um, however, over time, we have been doing that. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And so this is a fun topic. So, so, so I'm going to talk a, I'm a little segue into a little bit of complexity here, history. And by the way, so much of the stuff we do, uh, uh, was so great of being, um, having, having worked with people who, who were around in the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s, um, I could, I, and being present at the time when these debates that were resonating through the 60s were still raging. When I got to JPL, a few years later, I got to JPL around 1980, but the debates were still raging. There was an incredible fear among engineers at the time for non, uh, uh, about non-determinism. They were afraid that the system, and, and, and it's, you know, I say, well, what, the, was it just, Day Luddites, what are, what's their problem? You know, um, and so, it, 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 so they did their very best to try to make the system work. And so, if you knew the time on your watch with to with precision, you should know what your spacecraft is doing right now. You should know what every one and zero is, whether it's on every bit um, on the whole system. And actually, they tried to do that. Now they couldn't everywhere, especially in GNC. Guidance control, uh, 
but, but, we, but there was a real strong sense. And you might say, that's kind of weird. Why would that be? And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but that fear was really deeply held. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. It's a, um, it, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a preview. It's, the fear was based on the fact that um, they, they, couldn't, they felt that they couldn't show that it would work. And the, part of that was is that they didn't have the tools to be able to assess whether a system would work or not. Really, and when I first got to JPL, of course, everything was built by hand, literally by hand. My, in fact, my first job was as electronics draftsman with, pe with a number two pencil on vellum, drawing all the schematics out by hand, captured by hand in net lists, f and then finally laid out on light tables uh, the old-fashioned way. So our spacecraft were built by hand. And there's a real sense that, and the equipment that we use to turn it on, when we turn it on, turn our spacecraft equipment on, we wanted to say well, how we know that it's working right. We would go to the schematic and to the designers and look through the timing diagrams we'd, we'd made, and we'd actually put a dual trace oscilloscope, big Tektronix oscilloscope was about this big, two traces, no memory, just a, just a Polaroid camera you put on top of the screen so you could capture the trace and literally camera, you know, and you, and you would put, and you would basically measure this signal to this signal to this signal and take pictures of each one and compare that with the drawing. That's the only way you could find out who was gonna, if it's working right. You, you, there's no way to evaluate the system behaviors. It had no way, there was no such thing as a printf. There was no way for the system to tell you what it was doing. You had to look and watch it work at a very low level because they were being designed at, at the level of AND gates, OR gates, and flip-flops. Voyager spacecraft still working. 10, 10, uh, 10 volt, 4,000 series CMOS parts, some, some TTL, mostly, mostly not. Uh, and it's been working all these years, but it's, that's how it was built. Um, in the 1980s, we're still rigid, but with strong emphasis on deterministic sy systems. Um, we, um, things like uh, uh, in the guidance control, uh, attitude articulation control subsystem, they were allowed, for example, some cycle slips, which, by the way, so the idea is that you, get, you start the execution at a particular clock, tick, and you have 125 milliseconds to get everything done. If the processor's doing chunk, 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 it had to be done before that. And if, it's, if you weren't, the system was defined to be failed. Now, did it really, would it really have failed if the execution continued on past 125 milliseconds before it started over again? No, and they realized that by accident. Uh, and so they had things happen, and they had not turned on the fault protection software that detects when this would happen, and by gosh, it continued to work, even though it was slipping, because it caught up. Did it catch up? That's kind of wild. That's kind of, that's very unpredictable. Ugh. So we should kill it. <laughs> and they did. But finally they said, okay, you know, okay, this is kind of crazy. We, putting a rule that's that hard, you know, we're, we're, we, talked, we talked about hard real time, real time constraints. Well, it turns out that's not really true. Shh, don't tell anybody. Even with GNC systems, where you have to show that the system is stable, that you don't put poles on the right half plane, that's not, you know, it, you, you can be in the right half plane for a little while. Just bring them back. Hurry up, catch up, point the poles back. And so it doesn't, it, does, it turns out that we realize that our systems can be late and still survive. Since I'm rarely on time, I've learned that. I'm still working at JPL. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, sh Florence knows. I'm a just-in-timer. Okay, uh, so, so, so in the 90s, though, he started, because uh, there's some really cool things. So, you know, you, you know, there's a sense of our business being very antiquated, always decade or more behind the times. That is a true statement. Uh, however, we're always influenced by the outside world. Why? Because how do we get influenced if we're building space? Well, it's because we don't always build spacecraft. We don't always build support equipment. And other things where we have to, we can go state of the art. We can, we can and back in the not early, uh, late 80s and early 90s, we were buying single board computers. 68,000s, remember those? Huracan 68,000 boards, you can plug it with a, either Multibus 2 or VME backplanes. We, use, we can use multitasking operating systems. Oh, we can go from CISC to RISC processors. Wow, all these great technologies are just leaping at our disposal. Meanwhile, this flight system is still clink, 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 10,000 bits per second, 10,000 instructions per second. 
Um, so we said, well, wouldn't it be great? So the very, the very builders of the spacecraft community were like, geez, it's so much easier to build the stuff here, and they're so much more powerful, and we know how to make it more reliable. We can do all these great things. How can we sneak them in? So in the 1990s, we started sneaking in commercial technology because the commercial world was also um, uh, the, military, uh, the military business in the 1980s was very heavy on, 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 these, on, on military uh, uh, radiation-hardened, uh, uh, nuclear-hardened devices. And it turns out those foundry lines were, were getting kind of bored, and they, they started taking commercial lines, like the, the power PC, and they transferred it over to the rad-hard lines. And then they were reselling it to us. We're going, yes, we'll take it. And so things like... Programming in C, multitasking, um, all, uh, and, and using commercial off-the-shelf bases. And so, um, we, were, we actually taken uh, GNU software and putting it in space. So we were getting away with stuff in the 90s that, uh, because it was a faster, better, remember faster, better, cheaper, ever heard of that? Yeah. Uh, it, you know, it's, kind of, it's kind of derided today, but it's actually, um, we, we really, we were able to get away with stuff and try things out. And the trouble is, you, can, you gotta be careful. Don't, no, you can't screw it up too often, turns out. Um, so, so, we, the idea, so at that time, the idea of local non-determinism uh, was, 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 was captured. What that meant was that you, can, you don't actually have to be that precise. What you would like the behavior, the emergent property, to be true most of the time. So when you, want, when you, when you gave the box certain inputs, the, you, the outputs may not happen exactly at the same time, every time you do the experiment, but it always happened. And if it didn't, it would complain about it and, and declare itself failed, which is fine. That, that we'll take that. And so we learn how to test in that kind of environment. And, and our test equipment now were allowed us to see what was going on at a more macroscopic level. We couldn't tell you whether this task ran before this task always. Sometimes we could, sometimes we couldn't. Usually it was this one before that one, but not always. Is that okay? Yeah, it's okay. That's, you know, we, we get used to it. Um, and, and so eventually, we basically kind of gave up on that safety net of, of determinism. And then, and then, as I mentioned earlier, we realized uh, by the 90s, early 2000s, is that there really is very few, there are very few hard real-time constraints. Most of them that are in the system are because we put them in there either by accident or by some, or some sort of yeah, usually by accident. I say just <laughs> usually by accident because because the trouble is when you when you when you make your system too constrained and too and and you insist on this deterministic or, tie, or uh, threads when they're really not really there, not really fundamental, you're making the system far more fragile. And we've been dis we discovered that because the system would take itself down and declare declare, declare failure prematurely. It really wasn't it wasn't really broken. Why did it do that? So, um, and then in the 2010s, well, we, now we have, we sort of gave ourselves some form, far more freedom to design uh, uh, systems that are uh, more non-deterministic, um, multiple, in some sense, we gave local agency to, to di different systems within the machine itself. Um, we were able to allow for capabilities that we never had before, and the system got more and more complicated. It got to the point where it was really hard. We, we discovered fastening emergent properties of the system that we never intended. Um, but, you know, by then, the, the, the cat was out of the bag, Pandora's box had been opened, and we're off to the races doing some amazing things, um, and, and holding on to the, to the saddle as tight as we can and hoping not to fall off. Okay, so uh, this, this is sort of an architect picture. So this, this, this is a very simple. These are some of the spacecraft. Um, these are the durations they were developed in uh, and the, some of the capabilities. You don't have to look at the numbers, but, but generally speaking, there has been orders, in five, seven, in some cases, eight orders of magnitude of capability. Um, um, uh, uh, though it, I wouldn't say it's flight qualified or really qualified for space yet, but there is, for example, the Snapdragon processor that's flying inside the helicopter the Mars helicopter is going to launch in 2020. Uh, has I, I'm almost I, I I need to be someone needs to double check me, but I'm almost certain that in it, it does more instructions per second than all of the computer all the spacecraft computers ever sent to outer space by JPL. Period. Voyager, you know we'll, we'll look, so look look at Voyager down here. 
of Voyager, it was executing um, uh, 25,000 instructions per second. That's a screamer back then. <laughs> and that was, the most pro that was the most powerful processor. Most of them were doing a third of that or less and, um, because there are multiple processors in the system. Uh, uh, Galileo uh, was actually a, a little bit uh, is a little bit better at 0.15 for the for the attitude control subsystem, um, but really we're we're, we're working way to a, to one million instructions per second. So consider that you know your your, your iPhones you know screaming at five to ten billion instructions per second. Um, that, that this is you know your I, their cell phone is better than all the computers ever ever flew. So it makes you wonder how we get anything done, right? So but you have to understand if you if, if you go back ten years. And you see, and you and, and you're handed a machine that can do say in 19, in 19 Mars Pathfinder MPF. When you're handed a 20 million instructions per second processor, and you're used to 0.1, that is a that's a 200x improvement. And not to mention the memory size went kapow because now we could in, in, in put dynamic RAM, which was told you will never fly dynamic RAM in space. Why? Because it's it's it, it's very very uh, sensitive to single event effects. Cosmic rays, protons, high energy ions, zipping through. Well, you can get over that, it turns out, if you have a fast scrubber and, air and multiple layers of error detection and correction, which is exactly how we did it. So we've had this incredible growth, and, uh, and it's been really fun. Um, so, but again, it's always lagging by about a decade, uh, or in some cases more, uh, the commercial world. And that's for good reason, by the way. You guys know why that is. Because it's very expensive to build a processor for radiation hardened environment. You go to, so you go, to, you go to Qualcomm or some other company and says, knock, knock. Um, can you make us a rat hard processor, please? Well, how many, how many units do you want to be selling? I, says, oh, I need three. <laughs> uh, OK? No. They're not going to do it. There's just no money in it for them. So, but so, so our, our, the motivation for evolution in our spacecraft um, is, uh, is, has been really interesting. You might say, what was the main motivation for autonomy or autonomous systems? And it's really, it's risk reduction. Say, so the historical, this is one of my main points I want to get across, that uh, fear of, of losing our asset is our number one, uh, it was the number one motivator to allow project managers to fork over precious money to put and put to add complexity into their precious machines uh, at all, um, because if we could control it, um, if you make it simple, and by the way, autonomy and ground software, or even the flight software development, tends to be in the order of five percent. Uh, Steve, you pointed that out, but I, that's a great. That was a, that was a very, it's a well-known thing. So it's you know if you if coming up with new ways of saving operations cost and, or software costs, uh, the most you'll save on a project is 5%. And, that, and it's going to be less than that. So there's not a huge financial incentive to try to, to make things simpler or make things more, put in more advanced. But the other hand, if you want to say, if you put this software in, and this, if this stuff ha goes wrong, this software will there protect you. They're going to go, oh, yeah, I like that. I'm flying it. And so we'll, and that's what we do. So, so, so uh, um, it's this insurance policy was intended to try to make sure that when bad things happen, that, this, that the asset is protected. And that you have, you can, and pr primarily its motto is, live for another day, which is, means you don't operate through uh, 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 adversity or problems. You stop, phone home, and plead for help from, from the ground. And it, what's more, because the bar was set so high, it had to be proven to be do no harm which means that, it, that its presence cannot make things worse. And that sort of makes sense. That's, you know, what kind of insurance policy lights your house on fire? You know, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't buy an insurance policy that, that, uh, for your home insurance that actually improve, increases the probability that your house burns down. Um, so you had to, to come up with a way to, to, to make, prove, somehow prove it. Unfortunately, we're not that good at it because occasionally it does make things worse. But very rarely, because we work so hard at it. Um, so, uh, so in general, the project managers did not justify cost 
uh, did not, did, they could never justify improving the system, adding autonomy for the purposes of making it better, to making the science better, to improve, enhancing science return or lowering costs. You just couldn't talk them into that. Just would never make any sense to them. And that, sort of makes, and, and that makes sense. So, so maintain the safe, safe state. Now, the first order of business, the great thing about spacecraft, is got to make sure, we, uh, the, for, if you're flying in outer space, a key issue is making sure you point it in the right direction, make sure you point it at the sun, uh, uh, and making sure that you can communicate with Earth. Um, so we, so, but our early d designs uh, were more physical side effects than intent. So in, in, the, in the Daniel Dennett, Dennett level, it's mostly level one. Like, uh, we, it, it, basically, this was a giant, not even a thermostat, it was somewhere between a thermostat and a bimetallic strip. It was very low level. And so, so it looks like it's controlling itself, but it's really, well, it's really not. It's, it's, not, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an emergent property of, of physic, almost physical systems. Um, so, um, so over time, JPL learned, and this is, interesting mind, this is a JPL talk, not a NASA talk, um, uh, that, that, that if we can imbibe, if we can, if we can get the designer intent into the mind's eye of the system, into the, into the, into the somehow and codify uh, the, the, both its environment and its own state inside the machine, that in some, in some sense, um, uh, this will actually provide benefits, not to the mission, but in many other ways, including reliability. It actually makes the system more reliable. Um, it took us a while to do that, but I mean, it took us about, I think it took about 20 years at least to do that. Um, uh, so the idea is if, if you have a model of, this, of itself or its environment and what's measured greatly differs from that model, something weird is going on. So you have to take some sort of action and, for, and somehow force the system by marching it toward some end state, um, a pr preferably a safe state. Um, sometimes, if we're really bold, a, a state that might even be operational, where we can actually continue to fail, fail, fail and operate through the an an anomaly. If you think about guidance control, if, there's a, if there, something came along and whacked the vehicle and it, and it, and it and uh, depending on where the thresholds are sent, if it's not too severe, it'll just march itself back to the right orientation, including um, guiding itself around uh, uh, three-dimensional obstacles, such as a, 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 the bright sun on a shouldn't be on a radiator, radiator or a, the bright sun shouldn't be going in a bore sight of a very sensitive camera. Um, it will just do all those things for you. In some sense, so it, you, in some sense, you're giving a sense of agency. Um, so, uh, so therefore, um, the, uh, a model of its current state and its current and and uh, and and its relationship with its environment was es essential. So let me just talk about something that's very, been a long time out there. You've heard of Voyager. Voyager is very old. Um, Voyager had just been launched uh, when I arrived at JPL. Um, actually, I worked on it for an operations front for a very short period of time, um, uh, and I got to know the innards of that vehicle pretty well um, when there were issues on board, and so I learned a lot about it. Um, but one of the thing, cool things about it is, is so, so you might ask, uh, uh, when was the what was the first deep space JPL mission to know its orientation in space? If you answered Voyager, <laughs> you'd be wrong. Voyager has no idea its orientation in space. You say, hey, Voyager, which way you pointed? I don't know. Uh, you guys, well, how the heck are you, do you controlling the darn thing? Um, uh, they could know, know its orientation um, with, this, with respect to the sun, earth, or some other objects. Instead, it used a, a proportional integral di uh, differential controller, a control system. It was actually based on an analog design that had flown the Mariner series spacecraft. So analog, literally analog circuits, uh, lots of bars, L's, R's, and C's, that, that minimized the roll error from a Canopus star tracker and the Tudoff sun sensor. So really, it was trying to, all, when you asked it something, all it could do is tell you what the, what the signal was from those, from those sensors. And was, its mission was to, make, to null those signals, signals. And the emergent behavior is that you maintain sun safe, sun power, and calm with Earth, interesting enough, as a side effect. So, 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 well, how did you get Earth calm? Well, it turns out if you're that far away from the, from the, from the, uh, from the sun, out of these far, you point the, the, the antenna toward the sun, toward the, uh, point the spacecraft toward the sun, 
Earth's right next to the sun. So you just get this for free. Yeah. And so, uh, so it's, <laughs> it's somewhere, it's closer to a thermostat. So just as basically a thermostat. So Voyager has no idea. And yet it's still doing fine. And so the attitude control design, so the right answer is Galileo. So Galileo, with, even with a stuck antenna, uh, we actually gave it, uh, we empowered it with something that hadn't been done before. We gave it uh, a, it's, uh, a, a quaternion. We gave the idea that it, it had, its own, had a model of its internal attitude in an absolute sense, in an absolute reference frame uh, of, uh, that's with a, a sun-centered reference frame. At the time, it was EME 50, but now we would use something called J2000, which is a, a, a global reference frame, or sun-centered reference frame. So now, the spacecraft can know where, uh, where its orientation is with respect to the sun still didn't know where in the solar system it was. So um, um, this provided, so what's cool about this is that provided a way, a high level way to, a high level model of the current state, an elegant way to command intent to the vehicle from Earth. And it provided a way to restore intended command attitude in the presence or after a fault, which is a key feature to this. So you can say, so, uh, because, because if, if, you, if you whacked Voyager and, and it, and if, it, if its gyros weren't running, um, it would take a long time to figure out what to do. But a good, I mean, fortunately, it will eventually minimize the control error, but it has to go through this fairly long sequence of putting an intentional bias into the gyros, which causes it, to, as a side effect, to turn. And, it, and as a side effect of that, eventually catches the sun in the field of, uh, this, in Canopus, in the, stars, in, the, in, the star, in the Canopus field of view, and it locks in that position. So it's, it was kind of, a, again, all these behaviors were kind of like, hope for behaviors in an emergent sense. Uh, whereas Galileo could be, could be much more directed and it, it, it knows its orientation respect to the, to this, to the most important thing in the sun system. And it knew, it was get, we commanded an angle of between the sun and the earth. So it knew where in a circle around the sun or earth might be. Because um, um, we had to update that once in a while. Uh, so guidance. So guidance is the act of knowing where the vehicle is and its, and its position in space. So when was the question, when was the first deep space non-lander mission to know its position in deep space? And, and the answer, Galileo Vo Voyager, you'd be, you'd be wrong again. Galileo and other spacecraft of that era did not, was, did not know, as I said, its position with respect to the sun. It knew its orientation, but it didn't know where, physically where. It, um, uh, it, uh, they didn't, they, and, and they because they didn't need to, from our perspective, they didn't need to because we knew where it was. We don't have to tell it. Um, so this is something uh, that, uh, so, so we generally sequenced the direction of where things were versus over time. But, um, but over time, the, the right answer is Cassini. Um, in, 19, in, the, in, the, in the 90s, um, Cassini developed, uh, it was launched in 97, it was actually developed in the 80s, and I was actually on the, the team that uh, built uh, Cassini. In fact, I led the computer development for C Cassini. Um, we, we put on board something called uh, IVP, Inertial, Inertial Vector Propagator, which is basically a, a simple way to model the solar system, the, all the planets, all the objects, and where they were as a function of time. So basically, we gave it an app called IVP, where it, it, it could, you could say, hey, Cassini, po uh, point to Mars. Hey, Cassini point to Saturn. Hey, Cassini, point to uh, uh, Titan. Oh, hey, ca hey, Cassini, point to a spot on the surface of, of Titan while it's moving. And it's so, so, it, so suddenly it knew where its relationship because it had, we developed this, this tree. Now it was based on a 16-bit processor. It turns out Mars Pathfinder beat him to space because I was in Cassini and I, and I became chief engineer for Pathfinder. I was able to steal that design and I shoved it into Pathfinder and Pathfinder launched first. Ha <laughs> ha, got away from that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but no, so my friends at Cassini were like, so I say, hey, we're testing out your IVP, guys. Yeah, so they loved me. Uh, so, so, it, it, so we did the same thing, and we used that on, on the surface of Mars to, to know, give the lander a sense of where Earth was, where Phobos and Deimos was. We actually have a command in ASCII. You can say, point to Phobos. Check. If Phobos was down there, the camera would look in that direction. <laughs> Take a picture of the dirt. Uh, we, we fixed that, too. We did, it wasn't a big deal. He says, yeah, no, let's not do that. So keep yourself, yeah, it goes back to the thing. It's keeping it safe. 
and one of the, all of our constraints, all these kind of levels, you actually always have to give wrap, put a wrap around it, is conditionals, which is, okay, this is where it is, take a picture, wait, is it safe? Uh, and by the way, if you want to point to Phobos and it's down below the earth, there's nothing wrong with that, just do that. You might be silly, but just do it. Um, however, if you point to Phobos and, and the sun is in the field of view and you don't want to burn out the CCD camera, eh, don't do that. Uh, so, and so the so software won't. Um, so this, this new level produce, produced a, 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 a much more elegant way of, of controlling the spacecraft. So ironically, in the interest of making it safer, I mean, we did this in order to, to make sure we didn't damage equipment. It wasn't just for operability's sake. It was there from, we argued that it should be there because we had made mistakes in, in pointing other vehicles. And, and the, both ground operations mistakes and state memory of the spacecraft. So we actually, at, we, the justification for this was, again, insurance. It just had a nice side effect of making it easier to operate and, and, and more reliable at the same time. So, we grad, so over time, we, we created event-driven behaviors, um, driven by, uh, because we had state uncertainty. We, need, we needed to have assist ways to automatically, uh, with finite state machines, multiple finite stages, to, to, to detect when the system is change its own state. So we would have to model that internally with a, with a, state, with a state transition that says, okay, star scanner is broken. Now we go back, start over, and rediscover our state. Um, um, uh, in, in the past, though, our, these, but that was very, it, it, before that, you couldn't really do it because almost all the actions we were doing was based on absolute time. So as I said at the beginning, it was that, uh, so, it was, it was you'd send, you would send a script with an absolute time, and, and that's exactly when that command happened, whether that command was safe or not. We'd have to, what we would do is you would execute, if the command was not safe, the command would execute, and something would detect that was a bad idea after you'd initiated the command. So the thing when you send it, it says, okay, okay, turn the scan platform, and, and it says you're the, to the left, but you're already against the hard stop. Uh, the software says, whoa, whoa, you just gonna hit the start stop. So it stops it and then it errors out. It doesn't say, hey, that doesn't make sense at the big beginning. So that level, higher level of, of reasoning were not part of these early designs until, until about the 90s and 2000s. And of course, again, I mentioned before, testability before was, was limited by the equipment. So we had to do it these other ways. And, and, and we couldn't do Monte Carlo testing because we didn't have the computers to do that. Um, uh, and we didn't, nor would you have the models for that matter. Um, uh, so today, even today, many events are still absolute time. You can still do absolute do time. In fact, if you're doing a directed correction maneuver, you, you don't want to put it off for a few hours. If you, if you do that, you're going to miss Mars. You know, if you're going to, especially if you're doing, the, if you're doing a, 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 an orbital injection maneuver or something like that, you, you got to do it on time um, with, to, with, with some accuracy. Um, but, but, but many of our events were now based on sensor-derived events or event relative times. And uh, that changed the whole modality of, of specification of how we talk to our spacecraft. Um, and we allowed for, this allowed for a detection of un, unanticipated events, which is really great. So you can make the system more, more likely to handle the, the, when things go wrong. Um, you, you, it, it's actually much, much more easier, it's much easier to reason about the system when things go wrong. If, um, um, but, but, with that, but, but with just a time-based system, it, you couldn't do that. You, uh, as I said before, off-nominal events occurring that are not part of your plan are not well handle, handled. Um, for example, when Cassini, which was very time-based, had a major issue, uh, they, they had spent months developing all, all the approach sequences. Whenever they have a failure, all those sequences are no longer applicable. You have to throw them all away and start over and is very time consuming. Now in some cases the sequences were t t uh, event relative, which case you can move them around, but you still have to move them around as a block. And so it, it, it makes, it's still very fragile. Gradually we, we, we added these more exotic states. We added state charts. We were very influenced by David Harrell's state charts designs. Um, uh, it's nice because you can, but comp you can, do, you can simpl simpl simplify, the, simplify the way of thinking about states uh, in this hierarchical sense, uh, on a, you can put very re remarkable uh, ideas of how to la uh, 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 define intent in a single page of paper with a state chart, which is nice, um, uh, e even, if it's, even if it's rather rudimentary. 
Um, we'd, we'd started doing replanning on board. Um, uh, the, the state, the state driven approach was one way of sort of replanning where you actually go back and start over and march your way through, through maybe a slightly different or altered state transition diagram, uh, state, state, uh, state chart. But in, it was replanning where you actually come back and re rethink about the sequence of steps based on the resources available. That was something that was is still being mostly done by hand, by people on earth. But you can start thinking about how to do that on board. And in some cases, we started doing that. Um, uh, our general model, though, again, is if something happened, the system would restart and, and, and it would rediscover its state by re reinvestigating the situation as it marched through a sequence of states. Um, again, all of these were added for the purpose of safety. It gets the mission safe. It wasn't really uh, for the purpose of making the mission better or improving science return. It's all about making sure that the mission succeeded uh, without failure. And so this risk aversion stuff continue with you know, our concern about hardware reliability. Um, always a problem. Uh, reliability has been a problem for years and years and years. It's still a problem. Um, our, uh, a cert certain thing, it's, it, that's one of the reasons you don't see a lot of COTS equipment on board, because some of it just doesn't last in space. It just, they, they, they fry. Um, um, absence of communication has force, forces a certain amount of uh, mission critical, if, we don't want to tell people, so if we have a failure, well, we're not talking to the Deep Space Network for the next, next two weeks. I hope that we don't, or not hearing from it for two weeks, I hope, uh, I hope that we don't have a failure. Well, that was unacceptable. It says, no, we've got to be able to handle failures when we're not listening to it from Earth for long periods of time. And also, even with, without communication blackouts, round trip lifetime latency frequently prevented human in the loop recovery for problems. So, so things like uh, um, Saturn orbit injection or uh, Jupiter orbit or injection uh, uh, for, um, for Galileo um, uh, really required a lot more t uh, uh, self-assessment of its current state and, uh, and an ability to so sort of say mark and roll back and resume um, uh, with new configurations after a failure. So we're very simple. So the, the, the fault protection designs were just where where uh, you would have you identify various fault containment regions. So if anything fails there, you'd swap to this one, and uh, and, and and it's it, and so if there was a diagnostic that said that something that was broken, you'd say, well, gotta be true. Let's quit. Let's go over. So that that was the architecture, and it's still one of the main architectural uh, elements today. The interesting thing. Um, uh, uh, if you didn't know where the problem was, sometimes you just have to swap everything. And that's what, that, that's, that's kind of a uh, uh, point of last resort. But, in, but another part is this, we're, all of our fault protection is really focused on hardware failures. Hardware failures are not nearly as common as operational errors. And we have, or, or worse, design faults where we screwed up in the design. Uh, these systems, uh, in, you know, uh, you know it's, it's, it's people say, oh, this is so cool at JPL, but I can tell you, these machines are just chock full of design faults. And even, despite our best efforts, they're, uh, they are, they're just littered with, with defects. And uh, not intentionally, but things we just, it's just, it's too hard to find before you launch. And uh, um, so, uh, um, so one, uh, one easy thing that we were afraid of is, is, especially early on, was onboard software itself. There was a lot of fear. I don't know if you realize that early spacecraft like Voyager and Galileo, uh, there was a way, to, there, there was a backup if the software didn't work. So in cases, on cases with, they would actually put special hardware in there that do certain kind of control loops. Sometimes they put another backup load of software. Um, so, uh, uh, and back in those days, the code was much more spaghetti-like. And the reason for that is because you, they didn't have the memory to be able to do the kinds of programming techniques would say with separate local auto, uh, automatic variables that are local, the idea of a, a, a lo, uh, everything, all the variables were global. That means that, means that it's, and it, it's worse, there was not enough memory. Sometimes the global variables had to change their flavor. So in, in one time, that global variable meant uh, it was an index. The next, the, the next second, it'll be part of a 16-bit int. Ugh. Does that scare you? It ought to. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons these were very, these were very unreliable because of the, very, the complexity at the assembly language level program and making these horrible things, making these things work. So we did, you, in some cases we did reverse coding. Some of you are familiar with, remember the, the, uh, the fifth computer on shuttle, the space shuttle. Uh, there, was, uh, there was basically two out of three voting 
uh, for three of them, a, a, another one, a fourth one for as a backup to those, and then and then a then a fifth one which was sitting there on a completely different design, sitting off the corner that was just to keep the astronauts from getting killed. Um, um, sometimes we do system design errors. We, we, we actually, but very rarely, almost always, if we, have a, if we have a design error, it's pretty much game over unless we can find our way around it. Galileo almost had that. The antenna didn't open on the way to Jupiter. And, and, and this is like an umbrella that opened up. And it, we needed that antenna to talk to Earth. But we didn't have we didn't have the uh, 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 the antenna didn't open, so its functional backup was an, it was a tape recorder, literally a magnetic reel to reel tape recorder, uh, where all the data was posted and then dribbled back very slowly to an arrayed set of antennas on the deep space network. Um, so most of the efforts were so most of the efforts though uh, from design perspective, the the argument was that there were no design faults because we tested it so well. Sure. Yep, that's true. And then, of course, we had the invasion of the Mars rovers, um, starting with Sojourner in the 90s. Um, uh, and that sort of it was a paradigm shift for many of us. Um, uh, we, we, and then uh, uh, in early 2000s, we, got, uh, we, we, we started up the MER project, Spirit and Opportunity. And then, uh, and then uh, just a few years later, <laughs> 2012, we, we, we launched this beast. Uh, and uh, the, by the way, they're, they're scaling nicely. <laughs> yeah, so that's the next one we're working on. Elon, yeah, <laughs> we'll call it the Elon, yeah. So no, we we got we got another one uh, another one like uh, MSL in the in the construction right now. In fact, you visit JPL, go look at the hype, go to the, go to the viewing gallery. You can see bits of rover lying around. Um, that's where they they're all born there, uh, all in the same place. Uh, but uh, the, the, what's interesting to me is. Uh, uh, the complexity associated with scaling itself. Um, uh, the, the, the infamous n squared problem has been a pro has been a really a, a challenge for us uh, because because of uh, er, er, basically emergent complexity, er, emergent behaviors that you didn't design into the system uh, that come with scale. Um, and there's also physical physical laws come come in that we didn't anticipate. Uh, we or should have anticipated we did not as we went from you now this the, basically going from curious uh, from sojourner to spirit and opportunity that scaling was actually pretty easy um, it turned out uh, because we were able to merge the pathfinder lander and stuff it into that into that rover so we knew what we were doing from the point of view design and but and the rocker bogus system wasn't so crazily different it did have to be packed in a complicated way so it had an origami sense to it but other than that it was it was pretty straightforward going from spirit to opportunity to that monster on the upper on the right uh, and it really was a monster it still is uh, it's it's it, it, you know, I, I, I'm not ashamed of it, but because I was chief engineer, so I shouldn't be ashamed of it. Uh, but it's it was very it's it's very complicated complex. I think we I, I think uh, we really had sh should have given ourselves time to refactor design when it was getting complicated. One of the reasons Cassini went so well was that we actually had a two-year delay. We actually during development refactored the design completely, took all those requirements. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Actually, Cassini, we refactored it. We didn't refactor MSL after our two-year slip. We just had, because we're too far downstream. It was too late to fix. So a lot of prototyping, like uh, design errors, were baked into the design, and uh, not design errors, but but choices, design choices. So it ended up being very complex. It had com more, the complexity was far greater than I would have been liked it to be. Um, but that happens. So we've had this. Um, um, the, again, with the cool thing about rovers, you have other problems. You have to now, now, you, now your environment's more complicated. Now you, have to, now you have to worry about getting stuck in a rock or falling off a cliff or sinking in sand. So we added new risk behaviors. Uh, 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 David, you talked about, about Mark Marmone and we getting his, we, you know, this is when you know, we, uh, CM Star was, was being adopted and, uh, uh, and we, were taking, we were taking a lot of CMU design concepts and stealing them as we love to do, uh, sometimes people like Mark, um, uh, and, uh, um, and, put, and put them on our team to help us develop these things. Again, not with the intent of making the mission better or faster, better science. It's all about keeping it from dying. So it, again, and that, and that, so that's really the emphasis here. Um, I, I, I don't say that's, the, uh, anyway, so I just want to just 
point of that, we use the same kind of thought process. Again, a Sojourner came along with Pathfinder, very simple machine um, computer. We, you know, Pathfinder Lander had a much bigger machine than little Sojourner with only AC85 microprocessor. Um, but it led the way to rudimentary uh, versions, first, first of all, kind of like a structured light as a way to, to produce uh, to construct a very rudimentary view of the scene in front of you. Uh, it presage things like connect structured light uh, through 3D reconstruction. We saw Rodney Brooks, reflective actions. Remember those? Um, whether we have simple, you know, it bug behaviors. Uh, basically, they're very simple state machines is what they were. Um, but uh, what ultimately allowed us to, to build more complex behaviors from a sequence of a, 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 you know, a cooperative set of simpler behaviors that chatted with each other. Um, and so, uh, and so, in some sense, goals became part of our thought process. Think commanding intent um, was something that would became part of our intellectual paradigm for thinking about getting system to work. I, again, we're way behind the, the AI community, but we're just catching on ten years later, as always. Uh, but but we did the same thing and, and, and elaborated on it with spirit and opportunity. Um, with this, by the way, the same processor the Pathfinder th flew. Uh, in, in the early 90s. Uh, but it's amazing what you can do with a 20 MIPS machine. Um, but we did st this time stereo reconstruction uh, 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 to construct DTMs on board. Um, it, things like visual audiometry and auto nav was, was primarily put and installed and agreed upon and funded, again, for safety reasons, uh, mission safety reasons, not because of science performance. Um, uh, but then the idea of closed loop guided goal oriented commanding really became part of our, for using the arm and everything else, um, became the whole thing, including for curiosity, which really did not push the state of art significantly, but just got bigger and more complicated. No, so the idea of other things for science enhancement ha ha really has been slow to be adopted. Uh, we had some notable exceptions over the years. Um, remote agent, which lasted, I mean, how long did we run it? How many days? Uh, two days? One day? Two hours? I don't know, something like that. Two days. Um, uh, it was an experiment on the, on the Deep Space One spacecraft. Um, uh, what's main purpose, again, was, was in this case, it, was a, it, it had an onboard planner uh, and, it, and a smart executive, but it, it was not really used that much. It was really just a test of the idea. Um, um, uh, people like Steve and others developed uh, Aegis to enable more op op science of opportunity uh, evaluations actually to catch a dust devil going on. And that's cool because it's really hard to do that randomly. You just have to take pictures over the t all day long. <laughs> Hopefully dust devil is going to be in one of the pictures. They said, let's not do that. So, so uh, um, in the case of 2020, we're adding more stuff. Uh, we're, we've added a lot more op autonomous operational capability in order to meet our, in order to meet our mission requirements. Be um, because we're trying to do, I think, 20 some samples over the course of a Mars year, and it turns out that's very complicated. So we've added a lot of, a lot more, a lot more complexity uh, to make that happen. We've also added t train relative navigation during landing. For the first time, 2020 is going to look out the window before it lands and decide whether it's a good place to land. It's kind of cool. Uh, that's kind of nice. So we, we've had some benefits. Um, you, you, the, the benefits with onboard models, you know, it's this key. Onboard models is sort of key to all these things. And autonomous systems can make better, we believe that autonomous systems can make better decisions than he, re, remote human operators almost all the time. Um, they have, it, it, these communication links, it's like, it's like looking at an elephant through a toilet paper tube. You just can't really see, what's it doing? I can't tell. I see something moving. No, that's a trunk. Was that the leg? You know, we don't know, and that's how uh, operating a spacecraft under these communication distances. That's the problem. Giving, giving situ situational awareness to the vehicle is makes me sleep at night. It keeps us all. It keeps us from uh, keeps us from uh, from staying awake all night uh, without it. So um, it also prevents operational errors. We have many times sent a command to the vehicle, thinking the vehicle was in state X when it was in fact state Y. And um, if the vehicle wasn't smart enough to know that this was an inappropriate request, it would have been it, it would be a, it would be a bad day. And so, um, so we've been very good about insisting that 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 we throw away. We do not it's just like your helicopters. You just it doesn't want to do that. You, I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Kerr. I'm afraid I can't do that. Right? So, yeah. So, <laughs> and so, uh, yes. Yeah, don't land on that guy. Okay. So. Uh, so, but again, model-based reasoning addressed a lot of development and also improved our testability. Now the vehicle is actually, it, now it tells you what it's doing. So instead of looking at the wires, 
we're, we actually look at the whole, we actually look at what it says and what it thinks it's doing. We ask it what it thinks it's doing, and it tells us. That, isn't that cool? And, uh, which is a little problem, by the way, because we're not really checking that it's doing it, we're checking that it thinks it's doing it, which is a little bit of a challenge. So I have to tell our testers, don't just ask it, check that it's actually doing it. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Yeah. So many of the things, operability has been a big, pro, a big, big advantage. Um, we've seen big improvements um, uh, uh, that uh, we can prove operational performance as a side effect to this, this reliability aspects. Again, it's not the driving thing. It's, it's, just, it's, a, it's an outcome of just doing it. That's why, it's, that's why we're still big fans of, no matter what the managers say, um, we, we definitely will like autonomy. Um, and, and it really makes our jobs easier in many cases. And, 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 and it also allows us to again, give the operators a sense of, of being able to command intent. So the vehicle knows what you're thinking about in some sense because you told them what you want, wanted. It, we're, not really, we're not really giving it, it doesn't really have a model of you <laughs> yet that will come on. It's like, I'm looking forward to the day that I always feel that you know, sometimes you know, there's certain people you don't want testing the spacecraft when, or testing a rover on Earth because when they're working on it, the rover doesn't like them and it doesn't perform as well, so we replace the tester and it works fine. <laughs> yeah, science enhancement, not really. Science enhancement, uh, we really enabling science with new abilities re that require autonomous, autonomous, I call autonomous alertness, being able to look out the window and figure out what to do and figure out what's the right thing to do. And that means they need to know what you're looking for and, and share your intent. If they have a different intent than you, that doesn't work out so well. Um, but we've seen inc dramatic increases in science access, um, like a rover. So there are concerns people have. Um, there's really enough state to really respond to all things. In particular, the biggest state transition problem is not the external environment, it's the internal environment. It's when the vehicle decides it's not happy or it doesn't start to work. And I'll mention that. Uh, so, it, so it's very difficult to be fully situational aware, not just of the environment, but of its internal hazards themselves. Uh, and so, if, and that's why I think you, we should, when we look at the system, you, the vehicle needs to reason about its own health in the same way it reasons about its environment. And maybe that could be done through a series of, of independent internal agents that look at the same idea in the same way you were talking about earlier. Um, um, sometimes they, they, they get in the way. I won't go to, uh, and by the way, the complexity of what we're doing actually, actually increases the probability of a design goof. Um, and I'll talk to you about one in just a second. We, we've had some case of misplaced autonomy we thought was the right thing to do, but it turns out we were wrong. And now we've codified it in, in, in C++, and, and it's, it's hard to recode all that stuff. We've done that before. We've had false alarms. And the, and, and the question is, how, is it really cheaper to do this stuff? Um, and, and one of the problems is that um, uh, you know, we were hearing with self-driving cars, think about the mass amount of testing going on that, that, that uh, Amazon and, and uh, Google and everybody is are, are working on. And it's a huge amount of testing. It's math. So we, we, we usually have, we build one vehicle that goes to Mars, one or two for lucky, and we have one on Earth and we have some soft sims, software sims. Is that enough? It's not a lot. And so it's really hard to get the kind of tests. Do we need, uh, in, in, in some sense, do we need explainable AI? It's a, that's another burgeoning field. That, um, do we need to be able to explain what we do? Maybe not. Maybe just look at the intent. Um, so um, I still, most of the stuff we've done so far is the design stance. Uh, intentionality is not yet part of it, but we're aiming for it. I think there's a real advantage for giving, uh, uh, making sure, codifying this, the intent into the systems. It's into its mind's eye. And not its own intent, but also a model of our intent. Um, so so uh, um, I, once we do that, um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll definitely have systems that are in some sense going to be more testable. Um, I think rather than reliability, as I've talked in the past, I've been hammering on this, the reliability has been the driver. I think the mission objectives, Thomas mentioned that this morning, I, uh, I, I think mission objectives and innovation will come from, uh, from science mission innovators themselves, uh, people like Jen. Um, people, uh, others, people who, have who know about what they want and start thinking about ways they can get there with smart systems based on these experiences that terrestrial people are having right now. So again, we're going to be following on the coattails of, of 
of, of terrestrial application, uh, uh, of, of, uh, of Amazon and, uh, uh, and other companies to try to figure out how to test and get these things working, and we'll steal that. We're going to steal it from you. And, and, we'll, and, we'll try, and we will conquer a fear we've had for decades um, over, over these systems. Um, uh, and I think so these will shape what we do in the future. But my view is just, it's, it's whatever is in our imagination we can make happen. Uh, there are, in our world, there are unique challenges, particularly the systems do degrade and, and change states. So I'm going to quickly, um, I've kind of listed these to the key benefits. But I want to say, this is my last slide. Um, uh, uh, we have to be careful. The systems change state. We had a situation occur 200 days after Curiosity landed on Mars. Uh, that very morning, it was in February 2013, uh, uh, the, 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 your, the, uh, Sam's spectral data had just arrived at about 5 a.m. that morning. Mars and Earth time were kind of synced. And, and we were really excited because the first time we were going to get a, a mass spec, spec spectra from the spacecraft. And we got it. And everyone was, remember cheering about that? Remember how exciting? Just a, four hours later, the vehicle started misbehaving. But it, it didn't declare a fault. It just refused to do what we asked it to do. We had sequences on Mars. said, OK, we're going to take this data, collect it, turn this camera on. And it just said, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and it did the, and later on, it didn't say why. It just said, no. It just didn't do it. And it's, it's, it, it sort of got in this Jack Nicholson mode. And so, <laughs> and go, no. I'm f and what's more, unlike uh, the architecture we had, was it, the, it, the computer is supposed to declare a fault if it stopped doing what it's supposed to do. But it didn't. It kept right on going. And it kept on going. And what's more, we, uh, we, we only had one hint. We got a little error message from, from the flash memory module con uh, control the flash file system saying that there are some addressing errors. And we looked carefully and realized one of our uh, NAND uh, flash memory uh, our file system had chips apparently had died. And so we tried it. So, but the vehicle was, did not declare a fault. It kept right on going. Yet it was refusing to do stuff. Why? Because all these tasks, as they do their job, push stuff into the file system. The file system, excuse me, I have a f I, I'll, I'll get back to you, but just, just wait. I'll, let me, I'm putting it into the file system. And there wasn't. It was just hanging. And, and all, eventually, one task after another started just hanging. And we, we have like 50 some tasks, 60, 70 tasks on board. Eventually, each task was stopping coming to a halt. And the vehicle looked like it was just, you know, just becoming lazy or malicious, certainly. And so <laughs> over, over, the, over the next, uh, uh, next few hours, we, we, we said, well, let's reproduce it in our hardware test bed. We put it, put it in there uh, and, and, and killed the de effectively killed that and watched what was going to happen. And we soon saw that in just two hours, less than two hours from now, the rover was going to turn off the radio turn off the receiver and do this. <laughs> now watch for the next 200 years. So, and there was no backup. We're starting to freak out. So, we provided a way. You mentioned this in your talk. We needed a way to kill this thing. The, the nominal way is the computer self-declares a fault, gives up control, lets some separate hardware, separate agent come along and say, whoop, that's not working. You, co-pilot, wake up, wake up, take over. Well, we, the only way to do, make this work is we had to kill the main computer. And we literally had to send a very low-level hardware command to hold, that holds the Control-Alt-Delete button. You know that one, remember those days Get, with your toe? Um, and, 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 and force a blue screen of death onto this computer. And uh, it... it it, and it did it, and within a f within a f about within four minutes, the other computer popped on and took over, Whew, just the nick of time. And we actually had other similar fun issues with other rovers going going crazy. Even a little sojourner w uh, would get lost and confused and climb up rocks that it wasn't supposed to. Um, so, a lot of the th th unfortunately, what happened was we had a, a we a, had a design intent that the that the system was supposed to work operate through flash file errors, but not whole chip errors. We didn't, we didn't include that in our thinking. 
And so our, our intent to make it fault tolerant backfired on us. And, and we didn't provide a way to evaluate behavior. And it didn't have on board an understanding of, of oh, I'm supposed to, you want me to keep working? Oh, you didn't tell me that. Um, it didn't, so, it didn't, so, so we had to redesign the fault protection and give it a little bit larger sense of intent and say, listen, check yourself. If you're not making progress over the course of so many hours and actually doing stuff, there might be something wrong. Go ahead and get a gun, shoot yourself in the head, let the guy, the guy take over. And so, <laughs> and, and that's the architectural paradigm. So, so I just tell you, this is, this is how it works. Um, uh, I, 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 and this, this is my last slide. So just to say, be wary of what you're doing because we we're not as good as we'd like to think we are. I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thanks. So love, Doc. Thank you so much. Now, one of the benefits uh, said we have a little more time, uh, so we'll do we'll take some Q&A, um, and then we'll... Uh, um, have uh, Mike uh, kick off the DRM session. That'll push lunch to sort of more like 12, 15, but I think we can manage. Um, and uh, so we'll, we'll uh, hand the mics around uh, in a moment. My, my uh, uh, observation, again, coming in from the AI perspective, <laughs> which is you know, not deterministic, especially <laughs> the deep learning. No, system. not at all. And a ton of time getting in trouble at IBM, just not taking deep learning to clients where you know, a non-deterministic solution had no business going. And uh, so that said, you know, there's some pretty, mm. if you look for situations where the non-deterministic nature is a benefit, uh, it gets really interesting. And you mentioned kind of opportunistic science, right, with temporal fleeting things. You know, if you have a Europa lander and it kind of goes, hey, guys, you know, I know you told me to scrape away at this ice for 20 minutes. But this thing happened, so I took a bunch of pictures. I hope that's okay. Yeah. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a good thing. Uh, so anomaly detection by its nature is often non-deterministic. You can't predict what you're going to deal with, so you sure would like a malleable system that can respond. Absolutely. You know, if you've got a six-legged ambulatory rover, not wheeled, mm -hmm. and one of the joints freezes, you gotta, it's got to learn to limp. Yeah. And, you know, the, the deep learning models do exactly that, you yeah, know. And so that fault, not just detection, but recovery, malleable systems and the non-deterministic nature in the way that they do that yes. is a huge plus. So I lo love these kinds of opportunities. So anyway, I, I'm very engaged in what you had to say. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's uh, get the questions uh, rolling. There's actually two mics because uh, Rob's um, got a lapel mic. So, um, and a third one right here. Question. Yeah, take it. So uh, buried on chart 19, you had, you had uh, science enhancement uh, mentioned. Yeah. Um, so it, it um, and I realize this may, may not be your primary area, but um, that, that kind of spoke volumes to me as to where we are in terms of autonomy for science enhancement. And, and so have those conversations been happening and what is your read on where we are, where we're going with There's you know, collecting, collecting data and, and making decisions based on the data collected out in the field? That's a great question. Um, I, uh, ironically, this is the, this is the, there was a time when, when we offered not just to, not to do lossy data compression, but lossless data compression on science data the scientific community was a howl. It was, it was, and then eventually with Galileo with the antenna problem, we, they were forced to do data editing and data and, and, and lossy data compression. They got their data and they were very relieved they got their data. Where this has to happen has to come from the people who are directing the mission themselves, the people who want the science, people who want that opportunistic exploration. They're the ones that take, have to take the leadership position because they're going to put autonomy in series with mission success. That's how it's going to happen. If you put it on, on the side, if it's, if it's on an off-ramp or something you could de-scope to save some money, gone in a heartbeat, right? And so the way to succeed with autonomy, into, in, in, the, way to, the way to inject it is to make it essential, to make it part of the mission objectives. And that makes sense. Why else would we do it? Our, our, we, we need to do it because we need to do it. 
And, that, and, and as, as, as soon as we do that, then it will be there. Um, so my encouragement f is to be creative. Think about ways that you can use ca autonomous capability. Now, engineers will put in more and more of that for our own reliability and testability reasons. And we'll do that, and, and, and we're well on that path. But to, to really, to really to push the envelope in terms of doing, using autonomy, you almost have to turn around. Where can autonomy make a mission happen? And that's, that's to be the question that we address. And I'm really excited about today and tomorrow because that's where we're going to focus. And that's, re that's where we should go. Bill has a mic next. All right, Bill. So a, uh, first an observation. I was impressed by the four-digit placeholder for the slide numbers. Yeah. And wondered how you never high know. That's, that's ever gone. Yeah. No, I, I have Y2K issues in my slides. <laughs> uh, question on, on this sort of um, characteristic 10-year lag behind spacecraft technology and commercial technology. Um, the, the, this issue about... Um, you know, the focus on component and system reliability, hardware performance, reliability, robustness, yeah. et cetera. And yet, I, you state, you answered one of my questions in your talk when you said, you know, it's usually design problems, yeah. design errors, uh, or software or coding errors or things like that that actually make missions go wrong. Are we focused too much on the narrow end of the wedge when we, when we look at, you know, robustness of components that forces us to be, you know, so many years behind the state of the art? Is there a way to, and, and is there even a, a motivation or an interest uh, to compress that? You know, is there are yeah, anybody yeah. looking at, hey, let's, let's, let's go to five years or let's go to two years? Or yeah, no, like you that. can do that. No, like the helicopter is trying to do that. Yeah. I mean, but the way they're getting away with it, they are doing radiation testing, by the way, on, on some of these parts. Um, but it's very narrow. They're looking at, um, so there's this different class of failures. One is you put it in outer space, it fries. You just don't do that. You got, you know, it's just, why? You know, um, the, the, the other approach is to make sure it survives, and it turns out these chips do survive uh, with a relatively decent dose of radiation in the sense that they don't melt. However, they could misbehave. And so, uh, and things like uh, both single event functional interrupts, uh, uh, they call CEPHIs, single event upsets, um, uh, but, but in case soft latch up, yes. Um, but so what, the, what can happen is the, the helicopter, can, so over a period of some time, window of time, it will work fine up, to, up until some mean time between failure. And, and, and then it'll have to go through a reset and reboot, restart, re and power cycle, and then it's back to normal again. Yay, those are great, fly those, great. Can you handle that mean time between failure? If you're a helicopter, yeah, yeah. If your flight's short enough, in, in other words, don't take it for a long journey. The good news, the battery won't let you. <laughs> uh, so it's going to go bzzz, quick down psh, before the battery runs out. Well, here's the deal. We've got two questions over there, and we'll do you as the last one. Then we'll have to call it quits, but we'll have to uh, move, move ahead promptly. And then so, get uh, so, yes. My, my time. So, yeah. Rob, uh, that was a great talk. Thanks. Two, two questions. So, the first one, I think you said that Mars 2020 will be the first one, will be basically looking out the window as it going. Landing, yeah, yeah. Landing. Yeah, landing, landing. yeah now, well, before we did it this way. Yeah, I understand. So, but, but your point towards the end of your talk, are, there, are you and the other people at JPL working to build more autonomy into the science portion of the mission? Is that something that's In, in a sense, yes. Um, because of this high-level design requirement, a, a, a functional requirement from headquarters yeah. that comes in that says you've got to this, do this, these samples in one Mars year, okay, that's, yeah. that forced us to put in much more autonomy, in particular to drive us. One of the challenges we have is uh, the basic model is the vehicle uh, wakes up around 10 o'clock local time. Mars is a 24-hour and 39-minute uh, day. And so uh, it wakes up at 10. We send it commands about this. We actually send it before it wakes up, and the commands just arrive just in time for it to, to, to wake up. It takes this email message, in effect, with a script on of things it wants to do today, and it says, okay, I'll see how much of it can get done. And it does it all through the day. We're not talking to the vehicle. It's no joysticking. It's, so it's completely silent. We really have no idea how things are going. Not until one of the orbiters fly over, then we, and then the rover ha knows it's there because it's got a model of the, of, the, uh, of the flyovers, and it throws up all this data to the to orbiter, which then blasts it back to Earth, which comes back to us that evening, 
Mars time. So when the rover starts to sleep, we get this there. Now we have until the next morning to get the data, uh, to, to figure out what to do for the next day or for the next two days, depending on how long the cycle is. So that turns out that is compressing our operational schedule because if you can't make your decisions up and make up your mind what to do, or, or you have to take an activity and break it into multiple slots, you breaking it into integer multiples of souls, Mars days. And so that's forced us to put, compress and put more capability in one cycle so that the commands we give it now are, are very much higher level. Okay, so my other quick question is, if Opportunity wakes up from its, powers up from its long cold yep. soak, what autonomy does it have to recover? Um, it, it'll it'll recover fine. Um, it, 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 the the question is is uh, we have we're wa we're waiting. It's a bit using a big dust storm, of course, and so we're waiting for the now the skies have cleared, sort of. Um, we have some evidence that the dust storm left a big pile of dust. Not a big pile, but a th thick enough layer that the solar panels aren't thick are not probably are covered, and they don't they need to be cleaned. So we're waiting for the next cleaning event, which is probably going to happen in late November, early December, so we have some more time to do. I know it may have broken by now, who knows. But if it does wake up, powers up, uh, we have, we have built-in fault responses to go back and it, and again, it tries to phone home. It's cycled with the, with the solar day, or the Mars day, and so it turns on its transmitter, sends little beeps that respond, can respond to commands. It will start to, it will try to phone home uh, at a particular time relative to high noon. And so uh, once we do that, then we can boot it back, you know, get it, start setting sequences and get it get back running again. So yeah, it'll, it'll recover fine. It doesn't do science on its own though. It won't say, okay, all done, let's go to some, find some rocks. It's not gonna do that. Uh, you know, it's, 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 gonna, it's gonna count on us to help it out. One more question then and then we wrap up with Jeff. Uh, so this is, I apologize for an ill-posed question. Thinking about some of the safety first uh, paradigms that, that people have talked about. Yeah. Um, thinking about doing more science autonomy and imagining a autonomous, more autonomous version of Cassini saying, you want me to do what? I'm not going to fly and crash into Saturn. That's crazy. Yeah. So how, I yeah, guess, I'm a, what, what are your thoughts about a future mission that is reaching the end of its lifetime because it's running out of radioactive power or, or whatever, and either having to decide on its own, you know, this is a good day to die, I'm going to go do this thing and because and, it's going to be amazing science and I'm not coming back, or being forced into that situation By accident. against its will, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they complain bitterly. Um, uh, I mean, to be honest with you, we have a problem. I mean, I, I, it was something we realized later is that, you know, uh, for, for example, uh, uh, opportunity, uh, if it gets stuck and it can't receive commands, it'll send out messages, it'll, it'll turn on its radio and transmit every day for the next million years, or, you know, until so it dies. Uh, so we have a little beacon stuck on Mars that's in one of our 27 available X-band channels. Yeah, <laughs> being an interferer now, and, and so we hadn't, so we, so we haven't really designed, we didn't need to design a way to kill it. We could. You could do it. It's easy to do it. We can reprogram it, for that matter, to kill itself. So it's not that hard. And that's so. In fact, it's, despite our protections, you know, there's something we always have. Something you know, we have also have low-level commands. We have something called command constraint overrides, where it's like, okay, uh, uh, here's a command constraint override command. Do the next command, regardless how stupid it is. Okay, kill yourself. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna do it. So yeah, it's pretty easy to program it to kill itself. But it takes some work. So thank you, Rob. Thank you, Jen. For your uh, presentation. You're welcome. We, we've been working over the last couple of weeks on design reference mission concepts, just basic ideas. And, yeah. and we're trying to be bold here, particularly when it comes to the science enhancements sure. for autonomy, right? And we've actually talked to a few people who said, hey, you're not being bold enough. <laughs> so oh, we, we kind of amped it up a little bit more. And, and now, I'm listening to your, um, I, with that slide that you showed on the command rate, commands per second. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Instruction per time. second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I'm thinking, wait a second. Do we need to pull in the reins? 
because <laughs> even with the 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 rate of increase, the acceleration of our commands per second that we're seeing from mission to mission to mission. Keep it going. I don't know if we can actually do the amount of autonomy that we're talking about. Is well, this going to be, is there any reason to suspect that the processors, even though they're advancing, are not going to advance fast enough to keep up with our ideas of autonomy? Uh, so is this a limitation? It, uh, if we make it a limitation, it will be a limitation. My view is b do not constrain yourself. Use your imagination. Go as far as you dare and we will work to keep up. The kinks, there's both, there's both we talked about this earlier, JPL, te technology push and pull, and they're both are happening. And so start with pull, find a mission objectives that says this is the technology we need to make this happen. And people will then start working to make it happen, and then it will come true. If you stop pulling, it won't happen. And we will be stuck with 1997 chip technology for the rest of eternity. Um, uh, but because, uh, well, cause, by the way, it, it, we squeezed that lemon a lot. You know, that late '90s technology turned out to you could last for almost 20 years, right? Um, but it's it, but use your imagination. Go as far as. In fact, I recommend all of you think. Don't let the technology. That, see that curve? We're still on this curve, right? You know, we're on that curve. We're gonna be on that curve for a while. We still got we still got plenty more to go. We still have to figure out how to fund it. But if you can put if you if you put autonomy uh, uh, capability as uh, as in series with the mission objective, in other words, the only way to meet your object mission is to have autonomy, uh, then just do it, and, and, and then we'll figure out how to make it happen. Does that make sense? Don't be, don't be afraid. I mean, and, and that, <laughs> so, so, don't. so it's okay to assume that we might have a supercomputer on Mars. Yeah, well look, we're, you know, it's, you know we're, we're, we have some, we're looking at something called a, 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 a W first, chronograph instrument, it's, which is being developed for, it's a, it's a technology instrument, ironically, to do this incredible processing job, manipulating all these very fine, fine-tuned optical devices. Um, it, the processing, the architecture for doing it on, so far on Earth, has been to set it up in space and have a high bandwidth communication system between the supercomputers, <laughs> pretty high performance, um, uh, arrays of multi-core processors on Earth, to do that, close the loop. So it's, just like this. Uh, it turns out the loop doesn't, this, W first doesn't have that communication bandwidth. So we're gonna have to figure out a way to put all that, basically the, all that multi-core processing in on board. And the way we're thinking about it is uh, doing specialized FPGAs with each, each FPGA has a set of core algorithms that it implements and, and an array of those. Now, and that really soups it up and, and allows it to give some capability. So we'll find a way. Don't worry. Just, just, just keep, just but think it. Think of what you need first. Don't, don't think about what's possible, what's not go. possible. Key takeaway, don't be afraid. It'll work. And Eventually. But, but with a, a practical history that uh, yeah. means, you know, believe it. It's going to yeah, work. Thank you for your, hey, your experience with thanks, that. Thanks, Graham. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> thanks. This is my right. yeah. Okay. So um, we're just to, we're going to kick now into kind of rapid fire DRM leads. Uh, Mike's going to kick that off. I have a, a three second uh, uh, um, uh, announcement though. The students that are involved in the lightning talks uh, later today, I'd ask you to meet up with Florence and others at the stairwell where we did the photo during lunch. So make sure you head over there during the lunch break uh, so that Florence can talk to you guys. Um, so, Mike, uh, over to you, and uh, each person, uh, each of the DRM leads is going to get uh, a five-minute uh, presentation, and um, your slide is right here. No, but this is very quick, very quick. Um, we're a little short on time. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the term design reference mission, we thought we would just provide a, a common definition for everybody to kind of target. Um, it's a, a DRM is a tool primarily used for uh, defining technology, for planning technology investments. Um, the DRMs should have consistency 
Uh, they should be first comprised of science objectives that articulate the mission goals. So everything we do is for a science objective. Um, we don't want just a technology goal, for instance. Um, we should be able to flesh out the instrument needs, high-level system requirements, uh, a concept of operation of how it would work, and then finally culminating in technology gaps. We're not doing formal technology gap analysis here, but this is just enough information to provide the technologists, the program executives, to understand where we need to make uh, future investments. So hopefully this will provide some clarity. Um, and then this is the list of the, uh, the DRM teams and the, and the leads. So if there are no questions, I'll, I'll turn it over. Okay, great. All the DRM leads, just glance at this now. The key thing to remember is who goes right before you. Because we're going to so memorize that name, uh, and we'll just uh, crank through them. That's just great. Thank you, Mike. Okay, so Emerson is up first. Okay, um, this is one. I'll switch. Okay, uh, so today I'm going to be talking, uh, just giving a brief overview of a design reference mission to look at the moon. So uh, I work on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera, as well as a couple other instruments at ASU. This is a uh, background image is of uh, Antoniati on the far side, so just to give you a little perspective. So the moon is relatively close. It's only a few days away. We've been there before. We've actually sent humans there and everything like that. Um, we've also sent rovers to the moon. Uh, one was human driven. The other one was a robotic explorer that was done by the Soviets. And uh, that rover actually made it quite far. It went uh, 40 kilometers in uh, just about four months. So that's a pretty successful mission. Uh, we've had a number of recent orbital missions. One is LRO that I work on, and we've learned a lot about the moon, that the moon's an exciting place, and there's a lot more that we need to know. And in order to do that, we need ground truth. And so uh, future missions to the lunar surface are gonna help answer questions about what's going on uh, on the surface and kind of tie all those remote data sets to actual ground truth. And automation and autonomy is going to help these future missions in terms of creating longer-lived missions uh, like a high-speed rover, as well as uh, if we have a robotic swarm of spacecrafts that are going to be exploring a particular area, or if we want to go and examine a uh, lunar cave. So one of the DRMs that we talked about was a long-lived high-speed lunar rover. Uh, this one would travel uh, across uh, almost 2,000 kilometers, go over four or five major geologic terrains. So uh, kind of collect samples along the way and take measurements. And then uh, in order to do this, we need to have some uh, automation. So precision landing, teleoperations. Uh, we want to be able to drive this at high speeds, one kilometer an hour. Uh, for a sustained period of time. This is possible you know, to do that uh, with a human driver. That's what the Soviets did. Uh, but we want to be able to do this autonomously. Uh, in order to do this, there needs to be some onboard decision making as far as, OK, what do, what do I do if I encounter a certain problem? And then uh, this technology can also lead forward into future missions where we can actually uh, work with humans in conjunction. So if a uh, if there's human assets on the surface and their vehicle breaks down, let's drive another vehicle over there, over there to pick them up. So this is just a little animation showing you kind of what the mission concept would be. So we would kind of land right south of Reiner Gamma, and we would kind of go and explore Reiner Gamma, doing a, a series of systematic measurements all across. And then we would kind of traverse up uh, kind of go over to Marius Hills region, which is a volcanic complex, and then we kind of work our way toward the Aristarchus region. Right south of Aristarchus, which should be right around here, is some of the youngest Mari deposits, so we can go and sample that and take measurements there, and then work our way around Aristarchus, looking at some of the pyroclastics, and working our way around to the vent. So, uh, 
getting eight or getting a dozen engineers and scientists into one conversation, there are multiple different ideas for what a DRM could be. Uh, one could be a swarm of rovers or hoppers that would go and kind of explore an area. So our example was to go and explore uh, a polar region and to look for volatiles or something like that. And this requires uh, time sen sensitive measurements, also to make sure you're safe over a uh, long duration. There could be limited uh, direct to earth communication. Another example would be an ISRU uh, excavator, which would not only have to kind of navigate and avoid different hazards, but also monitor the process, and control the process of harvesting uh, materials from the from the lunar surface and then finally we have a lunar cave explorer uh, so this is an example so these are all the same feature on the moon this is a slewed image so we're kind of looking over to the side and so there's a set of rocks here which are the same as the set of rocks right here so we can actually see from orbit 25 meters underneath the surface uh, so there we know there is some sort of cavernous void in here so for a mission like this, not only do you have to land within the 100 by 100 meter area, but if you want to get daylight and direct to Earth communication, you have to land kind of over in the corner. So your area of landing is pretty small. And now you also have a pit bot, which is a flying um, probe that would go and kind of use uh, jettison from the spacecraft and float around for a couple minutes. And so during that time, you're not going to have be able to control it from Earth. You're going to have to uh, do that all on board so that's it great thank you very much okay so it says next Good morning. Uh, my name is Ethan Asnas. Uh, I'm a robotics and autonomy system technologist at JPL. I've worked both on the research side of things as well as on the flight side. I'm co-leading this uh, with uh, Tim Schwindel uh, from University of Arizona. Uh, Tim is the director of the Center for um, uh, Planetary Sciences and uh, Geosciences, and also the chairman of the SBAG, uh, Small Body Assessment Group. Um, we're very happy to have uh, this great uh, group of people who are going to be part of this DRM. Um, it's a co combination of people from uh, NASA, from uh, the different centers, Applied Physics Lab, industry, and academia. So um, I try to m go around and meet some of these people, and I'm happy to, you know, I'll, I'll continue to meet them and we'll um, uh, go over um, that tomorrow. Yes. Okay. So, what I'm going to do is I, I don't want to go into what are the DRMs that we're thinking about. One, one thing I want to do is start off with the science, understand what we have several scientists on our, in our DRM and we want to have that conversation between the scientists, the engineers and industry uh, to really look at the um, science priorities and then craft these DRMs around these science priorities. But in terms of focus, we're looking at comets, near-Earth object, main belt asteroids and other bodies. Our emphasis is really to look at bodies closer to Earth. Um, that's driven by um, looking for opportunities to do the things in the near term as well as what would drive a longer term thing. Um, so as I mentioned, there are multiple things that would drive missions to small bodies. Not all of them are science driven, there's science objectives, there's planetary defense, res resource extraction, and human exploration. The ones with the asterisk is what we're going to focus our DRM on and uh, to keep it uh, within the scope of what we, uh, what we can do within the time frame. Uh, the platforms, I don't want to put pictures or anything because I don't want to uh, skew anybody's thinking in any way. Uh, there's been a number of ideas been floated around, but uh, we, we want to try to see what we can come up with uh, with a group face-to-face -face tomorrow. But just to give you, we're looking at things that are s could be done with a spacecraft, flybys and orbiting for the larger or small bodies, um, but also looking at getting to the surface, landers, and also doing things near the surface. Uh, but not only there, but what would it take to get into the surface? Uh, what are the signs? And when I say into the surface, that could be both shallow and deep. Um, so we'll see where the conversation takes us tomorrow, and then we're hoping to extract uh, some interesting uh, DRMs uh, to share with the group at the end of the day. One of the key things with these things is really getting the communication flowing between different groups, people coming from different backgrounds. So we, we know Tim and I discussed these things extensively and wanted to make sure that we get. Uh, 
we get to hear from the scientists what they like to see both in the near term and in the long term. Also turn around and, and uh, ask the engineers what they like to learn from the scientists to enable these things. Uh, and also uh, do that with industrial partners, what they'd like to know from scientists and engineers at NASA. Um, we're looking at a three-tier things that could be with today's technology. What can we do with today's technology? We want to look at what are the incremental advances in autonomy technology. There's a lot going on in, in industry. There's a lot going on uh, within NASA centers and in academia. And we want to do what are the low-hanging fruit but we don't want to stop there. We really want to look at very disruptive things. What will flip things around? We're going to stretch out, dream into the future, and see what could be maybe tipping point uh, uh, capabilities, revolutionary capabilities. So part of what we're asked to do is really come up with the steps. So OK, now we have three phases. We're going to do something for each phase. And so well, how do we go from here to there, and how do they connect together? So that's one thing we're going to try to do. Now, some of the things will have to happen uh, after the, the, the conversation tomorrow where we have to continue to interact to put these products uh, together for the uh, paper and the workshops. Um, okay. And what are the steps to do that? And I th one, this is the third bullet is a pretty challenging topic and it could take a whole day conversation or even multiple days, which is what would enable or prevent the infusion of technologies? And... Um, so we're going to try to touch upon this briefly to get people's thinking within the group and capture that. But I have been in conversations before on these things, and these could be very, very lengthy conversations. But I think it's only fair to capture the thinking from the group. Um, and then what are the elements? Um, so we try to put together the elements of the DRM for small bodies. And looking at things that will be showstoppers, and how do we overcome these? Um, our outcome is basically um, we want to basically leverage the diverse and collective knowledge, and we're very happy to have such a diverse group of people. Um, we'll have some follow-up conversations. We can do that uh, with telecons and as well as by email and put the products together. We're hoping to get one or more DRMs out of this and then provide some concrete recommendations, both from a programmatic and a technical standpoint to the, you know, to the program. Uh, and then these are the deliverables. I think you know Mike uh, went over them. So the, yeah. the uh, delivery, the last bullet there, um, you might, might want to consider a, a delivery to the ag yeah. instead of. I didn't list it. Oh. Um, White paper. Oh, did I miss it? Yeah. Okay. AGU. Ah, okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. We, yeah. It's on our radar. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. No, actually, it, it, it would be. Uh, it would, you know, again, within, um, it, it is captured in our, you know, it's with the comments on the thing. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you so much, Itza. Appreciate it. And Pat is up. She's already here. Super efficient. There we are. Close to the front. Uh, hi. Good morning. Um, I'm Pat Beecham, I'm the Chief Technologist for the Engineering and Science Directorate at uh, JPL. I'm also on the uh, Planetary Science uh, PESTO team, so kind of have two hats, and it's good to be able to see where headquarters can head in this whole area. Uh, I've also been very involved with VEXAG over the years, and so that's been really good, uh, because behind this DRM is a lot of work that has been done by the community already, so this is not something that we're going to start from scratch. Um, so, let's see, there was supposed to be a... Oh, you uh, yeah. So, so the team right now is um, myself as lead, uh, but Darby is the, uh, uh, the science lead. Uh, Gary Hunter uh, is revising the technology plan that I worked on about three or four years ago and was res responsible for delivering uh, when Laurie Glaze was the, uh, was the uh, VEXAG League. Uh, Jim Cutts is working on updating the roadmap, and that's, uh, again, a very community-based um, effort. Ian's at Ball Aerospace. Uh, Lorraine is uh, at uh, JPL, a system engineer and autonomy expert, or fault tolerance especially. And uh, Rebecca is our student um, 
scribe, and Michelle coming from Applied Physics uh, Lab, Johns Hopkins. So we have a great team, but we also have depth in the VEXAG behind us, and that, I think, is really good. So we've looked at these things in, in the Venus community for some time, so we have a fairly good idea of, of what we'd like to see. Uh, right now, the, the, the concepts have oftentimes been promoted as single entities. So we'll either do aerobots or probes or orbiters. But what we'd like to see in the, in, the, in the distant future is to have all of these combined. We'd like to see landers. We'd like to see um, uh, um, various types of aerial vehicles. But the conditions at Venus, for those of you that are not familiar, are pretty bad. So it's about 93 bars at the surface and about um, 450 cal uh, centigrade, 740 Kelvin. Um, at around 55 kilometers, though, it's actually pretty benign, uh, about half a bar and 30 centigrade. So you actually have ways of working this uh, where you could do a cooperative uh, science uh, from a platform that could actually work uh, quite nicely in conditions that we understand. Um, because the science questions then are quite, um, are quite well established. We really want to know what Venus's early evolution is like. Um, looking at the possible habitability and the evolutionary paths of Earth-sized terrestrial exoplanets. So this has a link now to the exoplanet community. And we want to make sure that we, we understand that link. And what is it about Venus that made it evolve differently from the Earth? Why is it a twin of the Earth but has, has ended up very differently? Um, we want to look at the atmospheric dynamics, the composition and climate history on Venus and how physical and chemical processes interact to shape the modern surface of Venus. We want to understand, are there volcanoes there right now that are operational? So there's lots of really interesting questions that we're, uh, we're looking at. Uh, if you look at, at the autonomy with respect to, to these types of systems, uh, obviously we want to answer the Venus questions from the surface to orbit and vice versa. We want to characterize a broad range of time-dependent and potentially codependent parameters. So a lot of this is, is looking at interactive uh, platforms and how you can get one to respond in, in, the, in the time frame needed for another platform to see what you'd like to see. So our, uh, our DRM then is really a mixture of all of these uh, platforms on the surface, in the mid-atmosphere, and in orbit as part of a coordinated investigation. Uh, and if we do this, this is the stretch goal, is to, is to have all of these cooperate. Uh, widely varying operational conditions, obviously in the surface to orbit, so they all have to perform with varying degrees of autonomy, simply because those at the surface, especially if they're long term on the surface, are not going to be as uh, sophisticated, let's put it that way. It's, we're barely able to do uh, two hours right now on the surface. In the future, we hope to do a lot longer, but it's still not going to be of the of the um, the capability that we can do uh, at a more benign environment. So an example then is a volcanic eruption causing by caused by causing seismic events and volcanic plumes, and how we detect these. We could de detect them on the surface and then tell the orbiter to reposition uh, an aerobot or an, an aerial vehicle, which could be either a balloon, it could be um, uh, some sort of um, airplane, but they have to be able to talk to each other. So you can triangulate location and monitor evolution of c profiles, etc. There's a lot of work that could be done by having these coordinated efforts. Um, if, you've, if you detect the seismology at the orbital stage, we're learning how to do that now with infrasound. It could be that we then tell, s tell the uh, aerobot how to go to that particular site and look. So there's a lot of opportunity for coordinated and um, uh, uh, efforts in the autonomy to make this happen. So with that, I'll stop. Uh, we we're, we're know what we need plan to do, and we will be doing it over the next day and uh, future, future meetings. So any questions? No? Okay. Thank you so much, Pat. That was brilliant. I, autonomous computing at 740 degrees right. Kelvin. <laughs> And I thought uh, the Ames uh, Pleiades computer had a heat sink problem as well. <laughs> okay, uh, on we go. Uh, let me get you started. And you're good.
Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Tom Swick at, at GAPO. I lead space technology development um, across the laboratory. And Bill and myself, Bill McKinnon, um, are going to lead the Ocean Worlds um, uh, community tomorrow, the breakout group. Ocean Worlds over the last few years has taken, um, as it moves forward, and you think about uh, uh, Europa, if you think about Enceladus, uh, you think about Titan, and then uh, other Ocean Worlds that, that we're starting to learn more about, um, has into the future large technology components. So from a technology standpoint, we look at it as real drivers on what we need to be working on today over the next five to ten years, sort of uh, uh, as a minimum in sustained development to um, get to some of the goals we want to, to look at. And that's about life, obviously, in the oceans of the ocean worlds. The, um, one of the key drivers in there, and there's a, a few tall tent poles in this area, one of the key drivers, of course, is autonomy, because as we'll learn as we move forward, this might be one of the first areas where the human will not be in the loop, period. Every time we've gone to a body, before you do anything, the human sits there for days, weeks, perhaps even longer before we start moving forward. So everything that Rob talked about this morning. Here it's not feasible. Um, Bill, if you wanted to, if you had a minute, if you wanted to say a few words for yourself too. I'll, I'll just say that um, uh, compared to what we've just been hearing about, uh, there are a lot of ocean worlds, but we're going to focus on the, the two poster children of subsurface uh, water oceans, and that's uh, Europa and Enceladus, and we'll, we'll leave aside Titan, which has surface seas of hydrocarbons, and uh, if you look at this graphic up here with the Mars helicopter, I mean, that and the proposed Dragonfly mission to Titan have a lot of sort of, in a sense, autonomy uh, drivers in common, but we'll, we'll leave that aside for now. Thanks. Uh, so what we'd like to do here, just to kind of kick this off, um, to organize um, our breakout group tomorrow is break it into three different concepts, sort of in time frame, time order. First, we'll think about a lander, the lander concept. There's one out there today. It's been worked on for uh, a good year or two years uh, in depth. Uh, we'll then think about a surface uh, type of um, um, science driver where we're thinking about moving across this chaotic surface perhaps into the crevasses, perhaps down into the crevasses, and looking at uh, access to life, access to the water at the very least that way. And then the third is the deep cryobot mission, which has a multi-year mission. Um, again, to go from the top of the ice crust to the, um, uh, to, to the ocean. There are, as, you, as I quickly walk through the first, first uh, the, these three different concepts, it's gonna be very clear what drives you. One is that you have a, um, uh, the communication constraints, as I mentioned, are just not going to be feasible to allow you to have any kind of interaction into the, in, the, in the loop as we know it today. It's going to have to change. <laughs> Limited lifetime. For example, the lander is um, um, maybe has weeks of time, and so you do not have the time to think about what you're going to do uh, and before you go do it. You're going to have to get going quickly. And then the unknown environment. These are very complex environments. Uh, there are not pieces of these environments uh, on Enceladus or Europa, as we mentioned, the poster children, where you can um, um, be there in a very safe known environment ahead of time. Uh, no matter how long you, you re re reconnoiter, you're going to be on a, in an unknown environment. That leads to then a set of needs. Uh, and as, you, as we march forward, you see these needs just get more complex as you go from a, a, a fixed lander mission to a, a mobility mission to a subsurface cryobot mission. Uh, resource management, fault detection, sample collection for the science is absolutely essential. These missions cannot happen without science. Very quickly, the second one, I'm not, uh, without autonomy. Second one, same thing, except now we want to move across the surface and now we've got to be think about perception slam, all the sort of traditional autonomous ideas we think about at Earth, but using doing this environment we're working at here where um, uh, we have limited resources, we have limited training. And then finally, uh, a long-lived cryobot is now take that, what we just talked about, all those limitations, and now put it through the ice where we have to travel through the ice from the top to the bottom perhaps a couple years of lifetime in, in this mission. What is the autonomy needed here? It's immense. And so we'd like to use this as a way to walk through tomorrow, uh, Bill and I discussing it. The, um, uh, uh, maybe the, the lander concept we talked about will be our kickoff point. We know how to do it today, okay, uh, at least for this 10 to 15 year 
um, uh, life cycle we're talking about for autonomy development. We could use that as a kickoff point in our group tomorrow and then march forward into some of the uh, additional things we need to do. Brilliant. Thank you, Tom and Bill. This sounds like it's going to be uh, exciting. Brilliant. Okay. Um, next up is Mike, and uh, I'll give you that, and I'll reset this for you, and you'll be good to go. So, good afternoon. Yeah, that's right, by a few minutes anyway. Um, so, I didn't really put much in the way of graphics in here because we're in a window to, uh, conference room, so you can look outside and see all my graphics. Um, so, this is really an exciting time to be in earth science and looking at new missions that the earth science community might be flying. The, if you look at the way we've been doing earth science for the past 50 years or so, We've had mostly unique satellites that have been flying, you know, one-off kinds of missions, um, and they're fairly expensive, and so that's one of the reasons that we only fly one of them at a time. Um, some of them have had successions, like Landsat, uh, which gives us a lot of information in a long time series, but many of them um, are single missions with just a unique instrument or set of instruments on them. However, there's a confluence of events that have really changed the way we're thinking about doing this now and giving us new opportunities. The combination of small sats, which are relatively inexpensive, uh, with high quality science instruments that can fly on those, large data volumes, uh, and not to mention the effect of our friends in the Department of Defense who spent over $10 billion in the last decade on machine learning and artificial intelligence has given us now some tools that we can use to look at flying Earth science missions in a slightly different way. One of those is we can do the same measurements, only cheaper, and we can do a lot more of them, which complicates um, the data acquisition problem. Um, and, but now we can start to look at new phenomena that are uh, transient and transitional events. Like, um, you know, in the past when we talked about measuring wind speed and velocity and, and that sort of thing, we, you know, we're basically flying scanning missions or uh, global mapping missions where we would measure the wind speed everywhere. And so I grew up in Missouri, so I get to pick on Kansas. Um, so if you're flying over and you come up over the horizon and you look down and the wind is 15 miles an hour everywhere in Kansas except for this one place where it's 150 miles an hour and you'd really like to go back and take a look at what's going on there. So now we're in a point where we can fly a whole string of satellites and have each of them go look at that place where it's 150 miles an hour, track it across the surface of Kansas and give a lot more insight into how tornadoes actually work. Instead of getting one or two measurements of the tornado for from space, we can now measure the entire life cycle of the tornado. This gives the science community all kinds of new problems to deal with, new opportunities to, um, to try and understand what, their, uh, what those phenomena are that in the past they got very small sets of measurements. Um, let me mention that we have a fairly large team of people. We've also combined uh, with the heliophysics community uh, in this particular event to try and talk, develop a set of um, DRMs that's, that can work with both, for both of us. Uh, and um, this work has been going on for probably about six or seven months uh, in a relatively formal way, including the input from a bunch of the science community uh, most of whom I think are not here uh, at this particular meeting. And these are the reference missions that we've come up with so far. We've um, uh, started to lay those out. And I'm in particular interested in what the technology gaps are that we need to deal with uh, because my program funds the development of that kind of technology. So, Thank you so much, Mike. Very good. All right. Rudra is up. Let me get your slides rolling. You can take that. Right. Well, good afternoon. Um, I'm Rudra Mukherjee. I'm a robotics technologist at uh, JPL. And for the purposes of this meeting, um, I'm a co-lead for a um, SMD uh, study on the, uh, on the value of uh, in-space assembly in, in developing new, new capabilities for uh, telescopes. So um, my, uh, my study co-lead uh, for the DRMs, um, Brad Peterson, uh, who's uh, the chief scientist for LUVAR, um, uh, is unable to join us. So I'll, I'll tell his story of the science, but I'll, I'll use my words instead of the graphs that I had. 
So as a child, you know, we would all look up and see the stars and ask the question, are there more like us out there? Turns out we were looking at the wrong thing. The stars are the bright lights. The life may be in the planets around them. And those planets are hidden by the light of the stars. And so um, uh, uh, extraordinary plants are another way to try and image the, the uh, or, or try to get uh, uh, photons from the planets around the exostars, if you will. And, and there are statistics that are much debated about whether, uh, you know, how many planets exist and so forth. But, you know, if I cut to the chase and talk uh, in terms of size, as Thomas said, every photon is precious, and bigger the telescope, better it is. But big telescopes cost a lot of money. And uh, big telescopes also need large fairings and, and launch vehicles to go up there. And so uh, in-space assembly is, is coming up as an opportunity to, uh, to, to address both those uh, technology challenges of, of you know, reducing the cost of large telescopes as well as overcoming the uh, curse of the fairing, if you will, while trying to image these, uh, la uh, you know, these hidden exoplanets in, in, uh, in, in distant spaces around uh, the, the, the exosuns. So um, quite a few things have been happening, and, and, and I'll draw upon uh, some of the work that has already been done in the study. So extraordinary thing that happened from our perspective is, is uh, the science strategy report for exoplanets came out and said they would like to have direct imaging uh, that basically says we would like to have a large telescope, at least in my head. Um, so what we know about our galaxy, I'll, I'll go this quickly. Well, there are planets um, that are common around the, uh, 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 the, the stars out there. And um, there are Earth-like planets around there. And we would like to get those kinds of squiggly lines uh, from them, and those squiggly lines basically tell us uh, what is the chemical composition. And from looking at the chemical composition, we can tell whether there's life out there. So yes, we're a blue planet against a black sky looking out and trying to understand if there is life out there, and telescopes help, help us do that. Um, size does matter uh, in this case, and this is a graph that Chris Stark put out. And this basically says as you grow larger, uh, the probability, and those are the sizes, of finding um, an exo-Earth-like uh, uh, planet in, in, in space uh, goes up quite a bit. So if you were at about four, three to four, three meter, your probability is about 12%. If you went up uh, to about seven, it's about th 35. If you went to 17, it went to 147. And so um, we've been undertaking a study uh, that uh, is called the In-Space Assembly, um, In-Space Assemble Telescope. And its objective is to understand the question, when is it worth assembling space telescopes rather than launching them uh, from single fairings? And so within the auspices of that study, we had uh, two face-to-face uh, -face meetings and about uh, 20 telecons. And the first meeting was at Caltech, and we brought together about 50-odd people who had experiences in significant experience in telescopes. And we asked them, if you took a large telescope and broke it up into modules, like Legos, uh, you know, what kind of a telescope would you like to have, and what would the modules look like? Well, so they gave us an optical architecture, and they gave us what the modules look like. Then we did another workshop recently at Langley, where we said, oh, what happened? Oops. OK. Uh, where we said, OK, so now we know what the telescope looks like, and we know what the modules look like. Where do you want to do it? How do you want to do it? Right? We invited about 60-odd people and, and talked about different launch fairings, different orbits, and different kinds of robotic platforms and robotic systems. Uh, we talked about astronauts. We talked about autonomy. And, and we came to a conclusion that we would like to build a telescope that looks like that, right? Um, it looks uh, quite interesting. It's, it's a 20 meter telescope, uh, the, the long distance is about 42 meters. Um, we want it to be serviceable, have a 30 year operating life, bigger, larger than that. We want it operating at Sun Earth L2. Um, we want it um, assembled at a cislunar environment to take advantage of all the commercial interest that's being generated. Fully filled, ap uh, filled aperture, non-cryogenic. Um, what's, what's challenging about it? Well, each of those mirrors are, are actuated um, to, to get the sunlight, uh, sorry, to get this, uh, uh, the planet light observed, you have to block out the sunlight, and, uh, the starlight, and, and so the photons matter. And the overall system has to be fairly stable. So we heard coronagraph, uh, Rob mentioned that. It's an instrument that requires tens of, me tens of picometers tens of picometers of wavefront stability to be able to measure uh, the photons and, and detect the signatures. So we want to build this thing in, in space and um, in, in, in the cislunar environment from multiple launches from those modules that I showed very briefly, and we want to do it autonomously. So the DRM spectrum goes from you know, multiple launches, the autonomous rendezvous and berthing of these uh, launch fairings, 
and then um, the robotic uh, assembly of those modules, uh, the control of the uh, segments and the instruments, and to be able to get to the you know tens of picometer level of uh, uh, stability required and, and image and exhaust exo, exo uh, earth. That's about it. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, you know, the, the, the emphasis for the next day is primarily going to be, you know, what can autonomy do, right? In space assembly in itself is a challenge, um, you know, and autonomy could be a key enabler, and so we'll talk about what the technologies are required and how would autonomy enable the different spectrum of, of assembling that thing in, uh, in space. Oh, in my lifetime. Very good. <laughs> Thank you, Rudra. Brilliant. Cislunar assembly operationally parked in L2. What a, what a vision. Okay, uh, and onward now. Uh, so we have Jen and Eric. I'll give you that, and I'll get your timer going. All right, uh, you can probably go to the next slide here. So uh, I'm Eric Linus, uh, and this is Jen Eigenbrode. We're the leads on the d Mars Design Reference Mission. Uh, we thought we'd introduce ourselves a little bit. I'll just do me first. <laughs> uh, so both of us work in the Planetary Environments Lab at Goddard. Um, uh, I'm a software engineer. I worked on the, I'm, I'm now leading the software effort on the Mars Organic Molecule Analyzer, a mass spectrometer going to Mars on the ExoMars mission, not on Mars 2020. <laughs> um, and I've been 20 years or 30, how many times? 30 years <laughs> of uh, writing software and being a software architect. So that's our, our perspective. My perspective is is uh, right is the software uh, and is the science uh, behind the software. Hi, my name is Jen Eigen. My name is Jen Eigenbrode, um, and I'm an astrobiologist. I think that's a catch-all term for a lot of different things, but really what it means is I I am a geologist that also does biology and chemistry. And uh, my, essentially, my uh, career at this point is to enable life detection. But there's a lot more to it than that. Planets are systems, and we have to approach them that way. Uh, so I have worked on the MSL operations for over six years, um, particularly in the operations. I've also worked on the SAM instruments, so I understand um, how instruments actually behave on planets and what it takes to make those happen. Um, I have been involved in proposing uh, uh, several different missions as a lead scientist, so I'm interested in how we actually um, deal with things like risks, um, the concerns that we have uh, for addressing our science thresholds and our science baseline, um, and we'll see how autonomy will feed into that. And the uh, last one is that I'm on the executive committee of MEPAG, and so a lot of what we come up with today will get fed forward into MEPAG. So the mission that we dreamed up um, is uh, to a geo surface subsurface geohydrology mission, um, and we want to map a, a large area of some part of Mars. The geo geohydrology of that, uh, we want to find the water and we identify its composition. Um, the idea is we could we could we could provide information potentially for a future uh, in situ uh, resource utilization mission. Uh, maybe establish a uh, like a scalable network for a future uh, human mission to Mars. Uh, we study this, the, the, the uh, exploration zone for a human mission. Um, our approach we were thinking of, and I guess this is things to TBD by the team tomorrow, uh, is a team of rovers, a lot of rovers, and I think uh, this has come up in the, the lunar uh, and earlier discussions that there's a lot of people thinking about lots of rovers. Uh, we were thinking maybe there's a, 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 a mothership like a lander that brings the rovers, has like more powerful computing, and there's networking on the surface, uh, something like that. Uh, these are all things we're kind of TBD. Uh, and then when the uh, astronauts eventually arrive to this site, these rovers continue to support the astronauts. Uh, and maybe that network they've developed and the mapping they've developed supports a uh, human mission. And the goal would be hundreds of square meters uh, or kilometers, excuse me, did I say meters, square kilometers uh, to study. So in general, from an autonomy point of view, what we were thinking of uh, is just, re think of it as replacing the whole uh, operations team. So Jen and I are both on the MSL operations team, and so are hundreds of other people, because it, <laughs> it takes a lot of people to operate the rover. Uh, 
and we can do it, and it's the right way to do it for curiosity, maybe because it's it's one big rover, it's complicated. Uh, if you get more rovers, uh, if you start going high speed, you're not going to be able to have this big team. Uh, you got to automate that, so they have to move on their own. Um, but also, the amount of science data now coming back is more than the science team can handle. If you had if you had four curiosities up there right now, that'd be a lot of people trying to support that. Uh, so we're thinking you need automation uh, in the science observations themselves. And there's been a little bit of reference to that. There's a lot of talk about uh, the autonomy of the rovers driving, self-driving, uh, all this stuff. But really, uh, it's got a really hard problem, I think, is to analyze the science data and make decisions on board to say, this sample's interesting. Or, you know, this might be interesting if I change this parameter. Let's look at this a little bit different and doing that on their own. And I think that's a big challenge for autonomy that's kind of been shoved under the rug a little bit over the years. Um, one of the other things we want to do is map the terrain. Uh, a lot of the, the autonomous vehicles depend a lot on knowing their terrain in advance, where they're going, what's there. So we've talked a lot about mapping where the rocks are and where the cliffs are and where the hills are. But we want to map it also where the science is. What's the water content? What was there? So in your map of the physical, you also map the science in there. And maybe even subsurface. You have radar looks under, underground. We map that as well. So now your autonomous science vehicles have a, a knowledge of the science as well as the geography. Do you want to cover this one? <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> so we have um, some water maps that are already available based on um, some of the remote uh, uh, platforms that we have going around Mars. And uh, though that data that we have is in the process of being updated with new um, models being applied to it. And we're expecting new maps to come out sometime around April 2019. And they will be uh, specifically aimed towards trying to understand the zero to five meter portion of the subsurface. And so uh, we're assuming that there's going to be um, even better precision on choosing um, the, the best candidates for a landing site. So right now, um, we just kind of went with some of the discussion that's already out there on the table for um, human landing sites because they have the same interest of having a place that has water close to, to the um, subsurface or close to the surface. Some of those would be like Arabia Terra, um, Hel uh, Hellas Basin, and some of the polar regions like uh, where the, the icy material that Phoenix has already observed. And so we're, we're using that as sort of just a, a baseline of saying, hey, there's probably going to be places that we can get to to do this sort of um, a DRM. And we're just going to pretty much leave it at that. But when we talk about go having this network of rovers and exploring the subsurface, we're talking about accessing ice or water that's in that subsurface and exploring that for, the, for its science, um, uh, science return which would include chemistry, life, a whole bunch of other stuff. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you both so much. Got it. Okay. Yeah, I love, uh, I was reading about the notion of um, uh, a pretty soon lunchtime. We're, uh, I'm sure you're all very hungry. So uh, the notion of cached uh, samples uh, to make, uh, to broaden the, the, the search area. Well, listen, the DRM leads did an awesome job. They kept to schedule. Um, we're right on track now. Uh, don't forget, students are to meet at the, uh, right now, before you eat, uh, so make it snappy, at the, um, at the stairwell. Uh, everyone else, uh, lunch is lined up there. I'm not quite sure what the protocol is, but I'm sure you can figure it out. We, uh, we will start again at, uh, I'd say about 1.15, should be about right. That starts to use up some of that time we got in the afternoon. 1.15, we kick off again. Uh, a great morning. Thank you, everyone.